Good evening, and welcome to the Cabinet of Fever Dreams. Tonight, a grouping of tales about planes, death, and the incomprehensible forces that hover above us. The Mirana Air series is a collection of stories about a haunted airline read by various voice actors from the creepypasta community and beyond. Tonight, the series is back as one big jumbo video intended for binge consumption. If you'd like to help this content travel through the rusty pipes of the algorithm, make sure to smash that like button and write airplane in the comment section. Also, if you'd like to support the show and keep these stories coming, drop by patreon.com slash mikejlanger for early sneak peeks, bonus content, and your name and opening credits. With that said, please turn off all your electronic devices, place your tray in upright position, and beg for forgiveness for all of your plane-related sins. We are ready for takeoff. The first time I met Lola was during a night out in university. I was drunkenly making my way back home with um, a poorly structured kebab and she followed me. She was no bigger than my fist and, and looked as if she had been born inside of a drainage pipe. Yet, despite her size, she kept pace. She followed me all the way back to my dorm, eating up the trail of meat and salad that I left in my wake, all while bravely meowing into the night. I never intended to keep her. Being drunk, I could scarcely plan past the next couple of hours. That night, however, I knew that Lola wasn't going to spend the night sleeping on the street. The kitten was more than willing to hide in the pouch of my hoodie to get past the security guard. The hangover in the morning was brutal, but Lola's purring made it bearable. Lola spent the rest of the year being the worst kept secret in my student dorms, and, <laughs> and then the next three years being the cuddly mascot of the flat I rented with my classmates. I got my degree and qualifications and went on to become an IB certified biology teacher. I'd hop around the international school circuit on three-year contracts and even though the culture and the continents changed, Lola remained a steady constant through my life. It didn't matter if it was hot or cold or if the apartments were clean or covered in geckos. Lola was happy, as long as there was someone to scratch her behind the ears. A lot of the spots where I taught provided pretty steep hazard pay, and I found myself in situations which I would rather have avoided, but Lola was the one constant in my years of traveling. She was a little piece of home I got to carry around. And nothing lasts forever, though. After 15 years of keeping me company, much of Lola's body had given out. She was blind in one eye and limp in one paw, and much of her day consisted of snoring on my lap. She would still meow with the same pitch of the kebab-hungry kitten, but you know, it was clear that Lola's time was running out. What made matters worse was that my three-year contract was about to run out as well. After three years of teaching in the International School of Islamabad, I was set to start a three-year stint in Prague. The day of flights and, and layovers would surely kill Lola. I couldn't bear the idea of her having her final moments in the cargo hold of a plane. Just, just the thought of... Leaving her behind, however, was just as bad. Lola was old and confused. I hated the idea of her going into the night without my company. Moving across the continent is hectic enough, but as the days counted down to my departure, all I could think about was the question of Lola. I had colleagues who offered to adopt her, and... It was still possible to buy her a ticket, but each day I just I put off that decision. 
I lost sleep worrying over what would happen to my cat. I guess she felt it somehow. Three days before my flight, after a night of complications, Lola eased my burden. She died. Uh, she died and I held her paw and I felt that last thud of life leave her. At the vet's office, they offered to dispose of her body, but I declined. Instead, I got Lola packed into an airtight plastic bag and, and took her home with me. I take her with me to Prague and, uh, and uh, get her cremated there. She could keep traveling with me. Turns out, however, that most conventional airlines aren't okay with transporting last-minute dead animals. My final two days in Islamabad were spent on the phone with every single airline that connect back to Prague. I repeated the story of her death over and over and over again until it had completely lost all meaning. And just, no dice. No airline would transport her. It started to seem like I would have to leave my Lola behind in shrink wrap. But then... On the 25th page of Google, I found a company that was willing to transport Lola. They had no customer service number, nor could I find any mention of them on the internet besides their website. But their fact was clear. Question. Can I transport dead animals on Marana Air flights? Answer. Yes. An option to purchase a pet ticket popped up. I didn't have much of a choice. Even though the cat was dead, she still had to be transported inside of an animal container. When I dropped off Lola at the cargo depot, the airport guard seemed really uncomfortable. But aside from that, everything else went smoothly. I took my flight to London a few hours later and was in Prague by sunrise the next day. I took a couple of calls, but eventually I found the pet cremation place that spoke English and understood my situation. Lola was due to arrive the following afternoon, and the cremation place wasn't far from the airport. It started to feel like everything had been figured out. The problems didn't start until I picked Lola up from the airport. The smell was the first thing I noticed. Even from the hallway, I could smell the undeniable stench of rot. It didn't even occur to me that the smell could be tied to Lola's body. It wasn't until I got to the pickup point that I realized something was terribly wrong. The airport worker was young and uncomfortable. First thing she said when she saw me was, we tried giving her a bath, but it didn't help. The words scarcely connected to my brain before the carrier box was brought out. Two eyes stared at me from inside of the box, but I scarcely recognized them. The dark green plastic packaging Lola was wrapped in lay shredded in the corner of the cage. The cat I was looking at looked like a carbon copy of Lola but I didn't recognize it. The eyes were different. I stood there in absolute shock, staring at the living cat in the box. I knew I had to say something to the attendant, but no words came to me. I remained awestruck by the sight inside the box until the cat broke me out of the spell. <coughs> The creature moaned in a voice low with exhaustion. I tried explaining to the attendant that this wasn't my cat, that my cat was dead, yet she just nervously laughed. When I kept on insisting that what arrived in the box was not what was sent, 
she called her supervisor. The supervisor also nervously laughed for a bit, but then he said that my issue was with the airline. I was told to contact their customer service line. I was also asked to leave the premises with my pet. Throughout the whole argument, and through the whole bus ride back home, the cat kept on meowing from inside of the box. It sounded nothing like Lola. It sounded like some horrid demon just being exercised and yelling, No! The cat meowed through the whole bus ride back, and everyone bunched up by the driver to escape the smell. When I let the cat out of the box in my apartment, it moved with a terrible swiftness. Lola calculated each step she took, but this creature rushed through the rooms like a guided missile. Once it scanned the room, it jumped atop my kitchen counter, stared into my soul, and proceeded to howl. I opened all the windows in the apartment and immediately set to finding the contact number for Marana Air customer support. As hard as I tried, however, I couldn't find any trace of them online. The whole way through my fruitless search, the cat kept on meowing. I tried to ignore the entire existence of the creature at first, but, but then it occurred to me that it, it might just be hungry. When the first couple of Google pages didn't return any results, I grabbed my coat and went downstairs to buy the cat some food. Getting out into the corner store helped me escape that terrible smell, but my clothes still stank like I rolled in a garbage heap. When I returned back to the apartment, I gagged. The smell had soaked into everything I owned. It won't eat. It, it won't drink. All the cat does is sit and stare and moan in those horrid low tones. It looks like my Lola. But I know better. I know that Lola drifted off to sleep on a chemical cocktail thousands of miles away. Whatever is sitting in front of me isn't her. I might be using her body, but it isn't her. I wish I didn't end up in this corner of the internet. I really, really wish that I didn't feel an instinctual need to share what happened to me. But alas, such is life. I need to tell someone before I completely lose my grip on reality and end up in an asylum somewhere. I'll share my horrible experience with Morana Air. But first, anyone here know if... 40 milligrams of max salt combined with alcohol, uh, two glasses of wine and a gin and tonic to be specific, can lead to hallucinations? I've tried consulting Google, but it's not giving me the answers I want. If you know anything about mixing migraine medication and booze, let me know. I want to believe that this was all just a terrible nightmare brought on by not following the doctor's orders. I really, really want to believe this was all just a hallucination. But now I'm here, and people don't come to this corner of the web for medical advice. So, I work a job where I travel to lots of small cities around Europe. Usually by train, sometimes by car, rarely by plane. My agency is based out of the States, and sometimes, rarely, I have to fly back to headquarters at a moment's notice. Yesterday was one of those rare days. I also have severe migraines. I take daily prevention pills, but I also carry Maxalt if the migraine slips through. They slip through pretty often. In that regard, 
Yesterday was a completely regular day. I don't want to go into too much detail about what I do, but I was in a village near the Polish-Slovakian border, attending to some business. My usual trips take less than a day, but this particular assignment was proving to be more time-consuming than usual. I was just in the middle of tying off loose ends when the call came in. Quick flight back, top priority. No exceptions. Rare, but not unprecedented. I drop everything and get in my rental. On my way to the village, I drove through the city of Poprat. Sleepy town, population of about 50k, but has a rail connection. I figure I'll catch a train to the nearest big city, jump on a connecting flight to Warsaw, and then fly direct. As I drive, I call my tickets guy to sort out my airfare. Again, I don't want to go into what I do for work, but it's important to note that financial oversight isn't a strong suit of the agency I work for. One might, let's say, deliver an expense report for a trip from London to Paris totaling around $450. That's a reasonable price for a last-minute ticket. One can deliver this expense report and then, without making too much fuss, ride the $60 bus instead with none of the accountants being the wiser. Me and my ticket guy have an arrangement. He finds the most expensive way to get from point A to point B, and then he finds the cheapest way to get from point A to point B. With a bit of graphic design tinkering and some stretching of the truth, the agency would fund the pricey travel plan. I'd take the cheap route, and me and the ticket guy would split the difference. My ticket guy quickly identified the worst way to get to the States. Poprad to Krakow by rail, Krakow to Warsaw by plane, a pointless flight to Helsinki, and then a direct first-class flight to the East Coast. Total price for a last-minute booking, $1,800. The cheapest flight was found just as quickly, but the ticket guy was hesitant to pronounce the deal. A direct flight with Morana Air from the Poprad Airport, lifting off a couple minutes past 1 a.m. $115. I didn't expect Poprad to have an airport, let alone a transatlantic flight. Neither of us had heard about Morana Air before and their online presence was slim at best. But a $1,700 split in my favor was hard to turn down. I told the ticket guy to book the flight, calmed down his worries about getting caught in the scam, and hung up the phone. It's in the exact moment that I hung up that the migraine hit me. I didn't make anything of it then, but looking back I can't help but think of that particular headache as a warning. It was as if my body knew that a flight with Morana Air was a bad idea. I took my first dose of Maxalt after I dropped off my rental near the Poprad city center. I still had a couple hours to kill before I'd have to make my way to the airport, so I decided to stroll around Poprad's old town and hope that the mountain air would wash out my headache. It didn't. Poprad's historical section is endearing but small. After a couple laps around the empty streets, I settled down at a restaurant to get some food. I hoped that a second dose of Maxalt would make me feel whole again, but it didn't. The gnocchi with bacon and cheese tasted exquisite, but after a couple spoonfuls, my body started to protest the meal. Not wanting to ruin my suit, I laid off the food and ordered myself a glass of wine. The wine helped, but it didn't help much. I followed the first glass with a second glass, paid, and then grabbed a taxi to the airport. The Poprad International Airport was just as small as I anticipated it to be, and just as empty as its size would imply. Aside from me, the only other travelers at the check-in desk were a bickering family of Poles, that were running late for their flight. The high-pitched yelling of the matriarch of the family did little to ease my headache. When I got to the check-in desk, the young woman behind the counter was excited to speak to someone who spoke at a regular volume 
and even more excited to practice her English. She asked a lot of questions about what I was doing in Slovakia. They were friendly in nature, but my migraine and my reluctance to talk about work kept the exchange professional. When she handed me my ticket, she said she hoped I would have a safe travel. Her hopes were deeply misplaced. With the transatlantic flight being that cheap, I presume that there would be crowds of people trying to hop on. But aside from the loud Polish couple arguing with the attendants at one of the gates, I was seemingly the only traveler in the airport. I arrived three hours early, as is recommended for international flights, but I presumed other travelers would fill in over time. They didn't. I would be the only passenger on the Morana Air flight. The Polprad Airport has two runways and three terminals and is significantly smaller than the city's old town. I walked around the airport, trying to focus on the breathing exercises my doctor recommended to deal with the migraines, but they were of little help. As I took my laps around the airport, I'd occasionally see the hopeful glimpses of the duty-free store employees awaiting a potential customer. With each circle around the airport that I made, more and more of the stores shuttered their windows. By the time my legs started to hurt, the lights in the airport were turned down and only one business was opened, the bar of the VIP lounge. It cost me 12 euros to enter the lounge. I paid an additional 5 euro for an ice-filled gin and tonic. Unlike the young woman at the check-in desk, the bartender had zero interest in speaking to me and did nothing to hide the fact that he wanted to go home. I did not mind. All I wanted to do was to hold a cold glass to my temples and catch the gentlest of buzzes from the gin. When my migraine didn't subside, I took a third dose of Maxalt. At exactly midnight, I was kicked out of the lounge with stern words of, Lounge close, go home. I did not complain or ask for a refund for my 12 euro. The headache ensured I was solely focused on getting into the plane and falling asleep. When the lounge shut down, the fluorescents above were turned down even dimmer. Walking through the empty airport in near darkness was somewhat unsettling, but by then my migraine had grown to a strength which made complex thought impossible. I was just happy that the fluorescents weren't burning my eyes. I sat in the dim blue light of gate two for the last 30 minutes of my departure time. There was no plane or staff or other passengers, and the boarding door was closed. I should have been worried, but the breathing exercises kept me calm and focused on the pain. I just sat there at the dark and empty gate, looking at the snow-capped mountains in the distance. I tried to imagine myself at the peak. I tried to visualize the snow and wind cooling down the inside of my skull and easing my stomach. That's when I heard the boarding door creak open. Somehow, in that mix of pain and booze and medicine, I had completely zoned out. In my fugue state, a plane had arrived. The departure screen had lit up with an announcement. Flight AD-1347, Destination Norfolk International, Morana Air. There still was no staff at the gate, and I was the only one at the terminal, but the doors were open and the plane was there. I was confused. I was definitely confused. But I was more concerned about getting in my seat and passing out. The Morana airplane made the small airport look even smaller. The Airbus was jet black, with the exception of a scrawled logo on its tail, and it was bigger than any plane I'd ever witnessed. The sheer size of the machine didn't dawn upon me until I made my way through the jetway and entered the plane. As if the entire baggage hold were taken out, I had to walk down a flight of steps to reach the seats. The luggage containers were impossibly high up, and the entire ceiling of the plane reminded me more of a cathedral rather than a mode of transportation. 
There was no staff to greet me, nor were there any other travelers. The only suggestion of life on the plane was the music coming from the speakers. It was quiet and slow, and had a strange repeating bass line that kept on changing in tempo. I once again found this very strange. I found the whole affair strange enough to shuffle up and down the plane, searching for a member of staff or another passenger to assure me that I'm at least aboard the right aircraft. No living soul presented itself, and soon enough my confusion was overtaken by the throbbing pain inside my skull. I sat down in my assigned window seat and tucked my suitcase under the seat in front of me and tried some more breathing exercises. I kept on hoping that someone would walk down the aisle, that I could ask for some painkillers or at least a splash of whiskey. But no dice. Only the weird music was there to keep me company. Not knowing what else to do, I continued the deep breathing exercises and gazed out of the window at the plane's massive black wing. On the edge of the wing, blinking irregularly, sat a blood-red signal light. It did not ease my migraine. For a couple of minutes, I considered getting up, knocking on the pilot's door. I was fully aware of how strange the situation was, but the migraine made the prospect of walking up the aisle to chat with the pilot seem just as absurd. Unable to balance the debate in my sore skull, I buckled my seatbelt and committed to staying put. The moment the metal on my lap clinked, the plane started to move. The eerie music crackled out of the speakers and was replaced with a static-drenched voice. The pilot's speech was unintelligible. At first, I thought it was because of the quality of the speakers, but it quickly became apparent that he wasn't speaking English. I waited for a translation of the announcement, but it never came. This, again, bothered me, but my body was drained enough to give up. I just hoped I could get some shut-eye and wake up somewhere above the Atlantic without my brain sizzling. I woke up much earlier. The first shake barely woke me. The overhead lights had been turned off, and only the dim shine of the emergency exit remained. Outside, beyond the red glow of the flashing signal light, the Tatra Mountains stood. Still half asleep, with the migraine slowly making itself known, all I could do was stare at the snow-tipped peaks and dark valleys past the window. The realization took a while to click, but when it hit, it hit with nauseating force. The plane was flying far too low. A terrible groan came from the bottom of the plane. The floor vibrated against my feet as if something had been scraped against the slim undercarriage of the Airbus. The plane was flying too low and we were passing over a forest. The sudden rush of fear tightened my throat. I tried as hard as I could to yell for help, to alert someone, anyone, to the fact that the plane was in danger of crashing. Yet all I could do was whimper. My whimpers were quickly overpowered by more dark scratches against the hull of the plane. There was no turbulence warning from the pilot. The seats around me were empty. I was alone in a dark, strange airplane, and I was certain that all that awaited me was a fiery death. Not knowing what else to do, I kept my seatbelt buckled and braced for impact. The plane swayed and shook, and the floor beneath my feet continued to vibrate. I've never understood people who are scared of flying. It was, after all, less dangerous than driving on a highway. I never understood those people until I found myself in that dark plain. Suddenly, the idea that this massive heap of metal was even in the sky felt discomforting. All of mankind's advances in aviation technology felt like a fluke. I became certain that I was sitting in a machine 
that was an affront to God, and that I personally would be held responsible for man's plane-related sins. I held my head in my hands and prepared for the dark rumbles beneath my feet to tear me down into the darkness below. I do not know if I cowered for seconds or minutes. Time became completely irrelevant. All I know is that eventually the noises stopped. Once the scratching had subsided, all I could hear was the gentle hum of the plane's engine, and beneath that hum, ever so gently, the eerie music that had played when I entered the Airbus. I raised my head, hoping to see the plane high above the clouds. I was sorely disappointed. I wanted to scream, but my panic only manifested itself as a coughing fit. Outside of my window, bathed in the glow of the moon and the blinking signal light, sat the mammoth wing of the plane. All along its length, the metal was dented with signs of terminal impact. Beneath the broken wings, far too close for comfort, I could see the crowns of trees. I was nauseous with fear, and my fingers felt like foreign digits, but I still managed to unbuckle my seatbelt. I thought my terror had reached its limit, but just as I pulled myself out of the row of seats, my fear reached new heights. A loud pop shook the entire machine. On the other wing of the plane, I could see the engine flare up with smoke and flames. The origin of the pop quickly became apparent. Geese. I could see them from my own window. A flock of them was flying right next to the plane, completely unaware of the danger. Two of the fowls got bumped off course by the wing, and then a third entered the massive engine. With another loud pop, a second fire broke out. Clutching at a hope for survival that seemed insane, I dashed up the airbus towards the cockpit. With all my strength, I slammed at the metal door. In my sheer despair, I even managed to find my voice. Words were more difficult to grasp, but the screaming and banging was enough to convey my message. The sole passenger of the plane was concerned about the imminent crash. I slammed at the cockpit door like a wild animal, but my cries were ignored. With each slam of my fist, that quiet music from the speakers grew louder and louder. Soon enough, my wails for help were joined by more dark scratches against the body of the plane. We were passing through another forest. The aircraft shook and groaned and the music from the speakers rolled on with its unsteady beat. But I did not relent. I kept on slamming the door and screaming and begging for a way out. The world around me was descending back into chaos, but I did not relent. I did not relent until I felt a gust of wind at my back. With an unearthly metal crack, a part of the Airbus gave way. Behind me, a scar cut across the metal wall of the plane. Bits of burning wood stuck out of the fresh hole like terrible birthday candles. With another deafening roar, a strip of wall to the right of me gave way for a burning branch that almost felled me. I fell to my knees and crawled away from the burning wood but I couldn't bring myself back to my feet. The airplane was swaying from side to side with nauseating violence, and my heart was balancing an incoming faint with bursts of primal adrenaline. Like an epileptic infant, I crawled through the chaos towards the nearest seats and buckled myself in. As numb and shaking as my fingers were, they worked quickly. I chose the center aisle seat. It seemed safest that way. Once I was in my seat, my consciousness drifted further. 
There was nothing else I could do. All that was left was to watch the plane be ripped apart by the forest it was flying through. With each removed scrap of metal, the discomforting music on the speakers grew louder and louder. I braced. I braced and I prayed for my end to come quickly. It did not. Instead, the plane shook like mad and the music grew louder and my chest compressed with unsustainable anxiety. I tried focusing on the music, but it made me feel ill. I tried to focus on my breath, but it was far too shallow to grasp. The only thing that provided escape from my terror was the migraine. It was still there, hidden by the panic and terror of the ongoing plane crash. I was able to ignore it. Yet, as I braced and prayed for my end to come quickly, the familiar pain became more pronounced. I focused down on the burning in my skull, taking apart each and every unpleasant sensation that I could think of. I did the exact opposite of what the breathing exercises told me to do. I held on to my thoughts of agony and squeezed as hard as I could. I let go of all perception and simmered down my existence to nothing but a headache. With my diminishing internal monologue, I tried to describe my pain with as precise words as possible. I composed metaphors and similes and poems that transformed my migraine from something that could be tempered with Maxalt to an insurmountable disease. I reveled in the poison behind my eyes until it took me whole. Somehow, in the middle of a plane crash, I managed to pass out. I, again, would like to believe that the entire flight was a hallucination, or a break from reality or whatever other explanation would make it possible for me to discount the event entirely. I was dosing way above my doctor's recommendations. I did have a particularly severe migraine attack. I was already highly stressed from work. There were a thousand explanations for why I might have misinterpreted reality while I was getting on the plane in Poprat. What is impossible to discount was that the flight that I took arrived at its destination. The panic and pain and sheer insanity of the aircraft pacified me, but when I woke, I was exactly where I passed out, buckled into seat 6A of Morana Air, flight AD-1347. Had I woken up in the strange plane I boarded in Poprad International, I would have no doubt the entire affair was a fabulation. Yet the plane I woke in had clearly seen a terrible night. The carpet had been matted in ash and mud and straw. Where the tree branches cut through the walls the night prior, now jagged scars of metal remained. The aftermath of the crash was obvious, but the plane remained whole. So did I. My immediate instinct was to run, to head straight for the door and never turn back. That's exactly what I did. I left the cursed Airbus as fast as my legs would allow. I was already a couple steps into the jetway when the realization dawned on me. Freedom was just a couple of steps away. A part of me was sure I could even hear the bustle of Norfolk in the distance. But I knew I couldn't leave just yet. My suitcase. All I wanted to do was to run to report my suitcase got stolen and never turn back to that plane again. But I knew that retrieving it was my only option. The agency I work for might skim through expense reports, but they take info leaks deadly serious. When I entered the Airbus a second time, the arched ceiling felt twice as high. That discomforting funeral music was back on the speakers, but this time it seemed darker, more tired. As quickly as I could, I made my way to my original assigned seat. 
my suitcase had made it through the flight, but it had been singed by whatever fire had burnt in the plane the night prior. I wasted no time sprinting back to freedom. Behind the desk of the gate was a boy of no older than 20, wearing an airport uniform that seemed to have been passed down by an older brother. When I dashed out of the jetway, he'd been scrolling on his phone. My appearance clearly startled him, but the moment we made eye contact, he went back to scrolling on his phone. I did not try to communicate. I simply wanted to get as far away from the Airbus as I could. It wasn't until I'd gotten a rental and started the drive to headquarters that I called my ticket guy. My recollection of the flight to him through speakerphone was undoubtedly less eloquent, but differed little from the account I've just written. I don't think he believed me, but even if he did, what would have changed? There's an all-hands meeting happening in 30 minutes, and I can't let myself be consumed by what happened last night. I hope that someone will be able to explain away my hallucination with a mixture of stress and pills and booze. If not, I'll just take my own word for it. My suitcase is indeed burnt, but once I get some downtime, I'll get a new one. All of this is best forgotten. All of this is best left in the past. One lesson remains, though, dear internet stranger. Never book a flight with Morana Air. It all started with a snake. Far too early in the morning, Verona Halchinova, aged mother of the mayor, was making her climb up the hillside cemetery to the church. Since her son was the head of the village and held considerable sway over life between the forests, Verona thought it boorish for her to not be a prominent member of the community as well. With the priest being, to put it lightly, an odd fellow, Verona decided she would serve as the village's head of faith. Her self-decreed title required Verona to not only attend every Mass of the week, but to also show up half an hour before the priest arrived to shame him into some semblance of sobriety. So every morning, far too early in the morning, Verona would don a fresh kerchief, grab her cane, and climb up the steep hill on which the village's little chapel stood. It's on one of these early morning climbs, with not a soul around aside from the pious Verona, that it all started. And it all started with a snake falling from the sky. Now, as an outsider, I wasn't privy to village gossip. I only found out about the snake on Sunday morning. Brother Donnet was stumbling his way through the end of mass announcements when Verona stood up and interrupted. For four days, she had sat in the pews and listened to the preacher avoid the unavoidable, the old woman screeched. There had been an omen. A snake had fallen from the sky, a cobra straight from the lands of Egypt. The Lord had sent a serpent as a warning, and that warning was going unheeded. Some in the church murmured in approval. Some hissed at the interruption, and Brother Donna didn't do much at all. He simply said something about the Lord working in mysterious ways and how we all must look into our hearts and see if we are at fault. And after a brief sneeze, Donnet continued with the end of Mass announcements. Verona once again interrupted the priest with more shrieking, but this time there was considerable resistance. You see, the priest was announcing the funeral Mass of a villager that was, even in death, more beloved than Verona. Sensing the shifting tempers in the creaky chapel, Mayor Halchin stood up and announced that a meeting regarding the snakes would be held in the town hall after the priest would bless his parish goodbye. Aside from another sneeze from Brother Donnet, no objections to the change of venue were raised. The town hall of the village was actually a decommissioned Bolshevik-era fire station that was solely used for funeral receptions and elections. 
It made for a poor town hall location. The space was never intended to hold a crowd, let alone an agitated one at that. The walk down from the chapel had let theories start to fester, and by the time the villagers crowded in the cement box, accusations started flying around. The main hall had little standing room or air, and the flickering of the fluorescent light bulbs agitated the crowd further. Everyone had a theory for what unchristian behavior might have brought on God's wrath, and everyone had decided to voice their varying theories in unison. It wasn't until Halchin had asserted his authority with shouting that the crowd settled down. With the same composure he handled every crisis, the mayor asked if anyone had an explanation for the falling snake, which did not involve the Lord's anger. Only one man spoke up the village veterinarian. He said that the snake might have fallen from a bird's beak. Perhaps a stork or an eagle had made a nest nearby and had simply dropped its prey by accident. The veterinarian's theory was not well received. By the time differing theories, theories which revolved around unchristian neighbors, started to emerge, Halchin once again silenced the crowd. If the topic of the mysterious snake was to be discussed through a theological lens, then it should be done by a priest, the mayor decreed. Brother Donut, however, was nowhere to be found. When someone announced that the priest's car was gone, much of the room emptied out to verify. With a taste of fresh valley air, the crowd calmed down. Accusations were still being thrown around, but the villagers agreed to postpone the discussion until next Mass. On my way back to the cottage, I saw no eagles or storks. Then again, I wasn't exactly searching for the birds. Originally, I only attended Sunday Mass to stay in the good graces of the village. Back in the city, I wasn't a religious person, and I definitely wasn't a Catholic. When one lives between the forest, though, it becomes difficult to not grasp for some level of supernatural safety. Up in that rickety steeple on the hill, I wasn't making peace with Jesus Christ. I was trying to hedge my bets with the forest beyond. That Sunday night, there was a storm. It was the sort of storm that makes you fear God. The rain came down heavily and thick just before sunset, and there was barely a moment without thunder. Having done most of the repairs on the roof myself, I was doubly scared of the howling wind tearing the cottage apart. And with the prospect of a thunderstrike frying my computer, I wasn't able to distract myself with any work. I spent that Sunday night lying in bed draped terror. It was well after the storm and I was only half awake when I heard it. It broke through the steady pitter-patter of tin roof rain like a brick through glass. An unearthly roar descended from the sky. The dark growl dragged itself through the valley for what felt like minutes, but there was no lightning anywhere on the horizon. The sound had stirred me out of my sleep enough to look outside, but when the darkness provided no answers, and the skies descended into silence once more, I went back to sleep. Just like the mystery of the falling snake, I decided to ignore the strange thunder. Perhaps because I needed something to distract myself, I spent most of the following day behind the computer. I moved out to the village to be closer to nature and further away from the trappings of modern life. But I work as a freelance graphic designer, so there's certain things that are inescapable. With a hefty day of screen time behind me and a certain curiosity about how morning mass went, I made my way to the village pub. As it turned out, Brother Donut's spiritual guidance did not satisfy his parish. Nothing of consequence was said, and the priest refused to pick a side on whether the snake was of godly or earthly origin. The steeple of the church was examined from below, but when the prospect of checking the top of the flimsy structure was floated, no one volunteered. The question of the graveyard snake was starting to lose its novelty, and it almost lost it completely if it wasn't for one of the farmhands. The boy had managed to spot not one, but two snakes warming themselves on a grave in the afternoon sun. Not knowing what else to do, the farmhand dashed down the hill and roused whatever soul he could out of the nearby cottages. A few of the curious crowd had witnessed the snakes before they scampered off, but 
the moment the sighting turned into news, the facts started to differ. When I entered the pub, the air had already turned thick with tobacco and debate. None of those who had witnessed the snakes were present in the pub, yet versions of their stories were being shouted across the room. The miller was certain that the two cobras were nothing but harmless garden snakes. The carpenter, on the other hand, swore he heard that the two snakes were cobras, just like the one that Verona had witnessed. Old Stefan, who did very little of use in the village, claimed that both men were misled. The creatures spotted in the graveyard were neither garden snakes nor cobras. They were a reptile dreamed up by the devil himself. Not only that, the grave that the snakes rested on was none other but that of the woodsman. The mention of the woodsman had quieted down the table. An uncomfortable topic, to which I was not privy to, squirmed itself through everyone's eyes. The whole pub became unbearably tense, until with a slam on the table, the mayor broke the spell. This is not the time to speak about the snakes. None who witnessed them are present, and no conclusions can be reached without evidence, Halchin decreed. Let us not debate around this table about who heard what. Let us do what should be done in a pub. Drink! Then the mayor summoned the bartender and made sure no man was left without the Slovovitz. Once the shot glasses were emptied, the conversation shifted away from the snakes. Once the shot glasses were filled and emptied again, some of us might have even forgotten about the alleged serpents in the first place. I arrived back at my cottage much drunker than anticipated. The slivovitz in my stomach made the stairs up my bedroom a mighty climb, and when I finally reached my bed, the world was spinning far too quickly for me to fall asleep. Half awake, I managed to crawl my way over to the bathroom and empty my stomach. Too exhausted to make the journey back to bed, I took my rest by the toilet bowl. I drifted between the numb darkness of drunken dreams and the cold tile of my bathroom well after the road lights had gone out. The headache came slowly. At first I was able to ignore the pain with sleep, yet with each new spindle of discomfort that popped behind my eyes, escape became more improbable. Suddenly I was sweaty and my heart was skipping beats. The punishment of Forslivovitz on an empty stomach had caught up with me. I drank as much water as my stomach could allow and lay down in my bed, yet the room refused to stop spinning. The rolling in bed was just making me sweatier. Getting up and stumbling down the stairs brought on another wave of nausea, but getting out into the mountain air settled me. In my underwear and a shirt that reeked of cigarettes, I, I stood out in the complete darkness. The road lights had been turned off and the night was absolute. With the exception of a silhouetted countryside and the burning moon above everything else was plunged into darkness. All that existed was the bubbling of the nearby brook. Sitting on the bench by the door, I started to breathe off my hangover. The drunkenness had long overstayed its welcome and my brain felt like it had burst into flames. Yet even past the hangover, I was able to enjoy my surroundings. I remember that moment well, that tranquility that reminded me why I left the city. I remember that moment well because of how it ended. The sounds started off faint, but nonetheless concerning. Like a burst of thunder dragged past its breaking point, it undoubtedly came from the sky and was undoubtedly getting louder. My brain squirred with renewed pain, but I kept my eyes locked on the dark forest and the burning moon above. When my migraine had reached its zenith, an imminent sense of nausea climbed up my throat. The louder the dark note in the skies got, the more my condition worsened. I only saw the source of that cursed roar for a split second before I had to avert my eyes. Big and black and shining red, the machine passed above. All the water that I had drank to hold back my hangover left my throat and my body collapsed in the grass. For what felt like hours, but must have been minutes, I, I lay on the floor and shivered in fear and weakness, unable to face the heavens. It wasn't until that horrible sound was nothing but an echo 
that I managed to rise to my feet. The sky was clear once more, but off in the distance, away from the moon, I could see two dim red lights disappear into the forest. The perplexing sight and sound had sobered me enough to lead me back up to the stairs of my bedroom. Being covered in mud from my collapse, I elected to take a shower. Shortly after that shower, I fell into an exhausted sleep. I had hoped that I would wake up and not remember the affair, or at least that by morning light I would be able to discount the whole experience as a product of drunken stupor. I didn't either. Instead, I woke up well into the late afternoon feeling like a corpse, with the perplexing events of the previous night burning in the back of my skull, right next to the headache. For hours I lay in bed questioning my sanity. When no comforting answers presented themselves, I climbed out of bed, pulled on some fresh clothes, and made my way to the pub. I had hoped that someone else had heard the terrible sound, that there would be some simple rural explanation to the phenomena that my upbringing in the city had simply robbed me of. Yet in the pub I found no answers. Instead, I found chaos. The pub was much angrier than before. Different stories of snake sightings had spread through the village and were getting aired out in the smoky room. The veterinarian who rarely visited the pub stood in opposition to the rumors with a few sober voices of support. He had seen the stork nesting at the top of the steeple. Others had too. The sightings of exotic serpents, the veterinarian claimed, were fabulations brought on by a religious panic. The bartender, as always, was the calmest person in the room and made no fuss about me getting a kofala. When I tried to ask him about the strange roar in the middle of the night, however, he nodded his head toward the lively debate about the snakes. He was not interested in conversation. He was enjoying the show. Halchin, befitting a mayor, sat at the center of the rowdy table. When I had first entered the pub, he was trying to calm the atmosphere with jokes and laughter, but by the time I sat down, his appetite for diplomacy had passed. His slam on the table sent a glass of wine and one of the ashtrays crashing to the ground. In no uncertain terms, Halchin declared that all discussion of snakes was to seize at once. On the following morning, a ladder was to be brought to the church and the steeple was to be inspected for nests. Any further discussion of the serpents until then was not suited for polite company. The sound of broken glass quieted the crowd, and the bulging veins of Hulchin's forehead prolonged the silence. On any other occasion, I would have stayed silent as well, knowing that I am still an outsider in the village community. Yet, driven by fear, I spoke up. I asked the table if anyone had heard the horrible howl last night. My question was answered with nothing but stares that bounced between me and Halchin. Over the months, I had been welcomed into the village community as an outsider, Yet asking the question about the mysterious night sound had been a bridge too far. I tried to explain myself further, to mention the red lights and the dark shape that moved across the sky, yet I scarcely got a sentence out before Halchin silenced me. No one else had heard the sound, he said. I was simply spreading further panic. As divided as the rest of the table was about the snakes, they were united on the issue of me speaking. This was no time for outsiders. I was not welcome among the village people anymore. With the pub silent and tense, I finished off my pint of kofala and excused myself from all social activities. I did not plan to stay awake that night. All I wanted to do was become unconscious as soon as possible and wake up to a world that I would understand better. The thought of that terrible sound, however, of that indescribable black machine of those two burning red lights, it, it kept me sleepless well into darkness. It was around two in the morning when I heard it again. The dark groan started softly enough that I thought it a product of my imagination. Yet when my windows started to shake under the strain of that unearthly sound, I knew that what had haunted me the night before had returned. Perhaps I was driven purely by exhaustion and confusion. Perhaps what got me out of bed was a morbid sense of curiosity. Either way, I made my way down the creaky stairs and out into the darkness. 
My stomach and head had recovered somewhat from the slew of its, yet the metallic bedlam above brought on the same discomfort that had plagued me the night prior. The roar was louder this time, much louder. The sound of the calm, bubbling stream had been utterly annihilated by the sky. All that existed was the burning moon, the silhouette of the forest, and that terrible roar. I watched the sky. Every fiber of my being wanted me to turn around and hide in the cottage, yet with tears in my eyes I faced the sky, demanding answers to the origin of that cursed roar. I saw the machine for but a moment, but that moment will forever be etched in my memory. Set against the backdrop of the bright yellow moon, its wings massive and shining red, I saw what looked like a massive cargo plane. It flew much lower than it did the night prior, and its roar was loud enough to feel in my teeth. My knees buckled and my heart beat throbbed in my eardrums. As a massive black Airbus passed above, all I could do was whimper in the mud. I could not see the machine, but every inch of my body felt it. The plane flew much lower than any plane should. When the giant was right above me and my terror had reached its zenith, I found myself screaming. Yet no sound left my mouth. The roar of the metal monster had completely ensnared the world. When the sound finally started to fade, I thought myself deaf for a moment. It's not until the gentle bubbling of the nearby stream edged itself into reality that I finally felt safe. The mere sight of the machine made me doubt my sanity. I did not look back at the plane's glowing wings. Instead, I looked out at the village. The road lights were long dead, but the windows of the cottages were lighting up one by one. I stood out in the mud, listening for any hint of conversation, for some sort of clue to what had just happened. Yet the villagers stayed in their homes and kept their conversations contained there as well. Soon enough, the moon became swallowed up in clouds that leaked lighting. With the first burst of thunder, real thunder, the lights in the cottages started to turn dark. By the time the first drop of rain left the sky, I made my way back to my home as well. I was still terrified. I was nearly going mad trying to understand what had just transpired. There was, however, some solace in the idea that others had heard the terrible roar as well. I would not be alone in my terror. Maybe I tried to convince myself someone from the village might have a perfectly reasonable explanation for the strange plane. For a while, that misguided ember of hope kept me company. By the time I had laid down in bed, I was snuffed out. There was no reasonable explanation. The Airbus wholly defied reason. I found myself sick to my stomach even trying to visualize it. The machine was at first glance just a particularly large airplane, yet the more I replayed those few fevered seconds of its visage, the more I became sure it was a thing of eldritch. The inexplicable nature of what I had witnessed kept me from my sleep for hours. Yet as the rain died down to nothing but taps on a tin roof, I found myself counting sheep. I never fell asleep that night. Or at least I don't think I did. I did, however, find some solace in those dark, tranquil hours. I found solace in the idea that I would get answers soon. That once the whole village had gathered and acknowledged the terrible plain, that my fears would be quelled. I couldn't have been more wrong. Long before the rooster crowed, I found myself on my feet. I wasn't planning to head to the church yet, it was barely light outside. Yet when I looked out the window, I could already see people making their way up the road. Everyone had umbrellas out, but no one was dressed in their church clothes. The villagers weren't going to the church to pray. They were, they were going to the church to get answers. The rain had picked up into cold, wet chunks, but no one was dissuaded. On the top of the hill surrounding the church, an agitated crowd gathered. Among the villagers, murmurs about the strange thunder from last night were starting to spread. Whenever the discussion of the unearthly sound got too loud, however, Mayor Halchin would 
quiet down the discussion. One crisis at a time, he said. The issue of the strange thunder would be discussed once the stork nest was retrieved. The church had been standing for well over a hundred years, and at its top it once held a bell. During the war, the Nazis reappropriated the bell to be smelted down into munitions, and the Bolsheviks were in no rush to replace it. Without a bell, the stairs to the steeple aged without repair until they became a death trap. It wasn't until the two farmhands carried in the lengthy ladder that conversation shifted away from the snakes and strange thunder. In quiet whispers, far too quiet for the third farmhand to hear, the gathered crowd of villagers wondered whether the church steeple would be safe to ascend. Perhaps because he didn't hear the concerns, or perhaps in a false show of bravado, the third farmhand climbed up the ladder without complaint or pause. It wasn't until he was halfway up the rickety structure that his steps lost their confidence. A gust of wind ruffled many of the umbrellas below. The church steeple creaked ever so gently. The farmhand became aware of the height he had climbed and stopped. For a moment, it looked as if he would descend. The farmhand's mind was quickly changed by his colleagues holding the ladder. Past the rain, they swayed between encouraging shouts and questions about his masculinity. The farmhand put on another burst of speed and leaped up the ladder to the top of the steeple. The storm drowned out what the farmhand was yelling. But he was clearly reaching out for something. Whatever he was trying to grab, however, escaped his grasp. One moment the farmhand was reaching inside the steeple, the next he was grasping at air. With another groan from the steeple, the ladder lost its balance and tipped towards the iron fence of the churchyard. A horrible scream that refused to die stretched through the valley like a high-pitched air raid siren. As he rushed down the hill to help the poor youth, the veterinarian called out for someone to call an ambulance. I managed to avert my eyes from the dying farmhand, but I couldn't shut out my ears to his horrid screams. Among those screams, I could hear calls for a priest. The boy wasn't going to make it. The boy wasn't going to make it and Brother Donut was nowhere to be found. In the absence of a priest, Mayor Halchin descended down the hill to comfort the dying youth. For a moment, the crowd of villagers on the hill stood in complete silence with nothing but death rattles and rain to keep them company. Then, seizing the opportunity for spiritual support, Verona Halchinova climbed up the church steps and started to preach. The snakes, the strange thunder, the accident, it was all a sign, she said. The Lord had seen into the homes of the village and found them wanting of faith. Calamities would keep on happening until each and every member of the village had atoned for their sins and accepted the truth of God into their heart. As she raved, the old woman kept on looking at me, as if I was the source of all of the signs. Perhaps I reacted to her singling me out or... Maybe it was because I was so starved for answers that I couldn't stay quiet. But I spoke out. I told the mayor's mother that she was wrong, that the sounds in the night weren't strange thunder but an airplane. The village was not being punished for some abstract crime of the spirit. There was simply a giant black airbus flying dangerously low through the valley at night. Even as the farmhand expired within a near shot, my explanation for the strange thunder produced some laughs. Most of the crowd, however, became angry. I was speaking out of line, and furthermore, I was speaking nonsense. Energized by the crowd, Verona launched into another religious diatribe, this time directed specifically at me. I had come from the city, and I belonged back in the city. It was only with my arrival a couple months prior that strange things started to happen in the village. It sounded as if Verona was about to list off these strange things, but her preaching was cut short by a barrage of hail. Within seconds, the shards of ice went from peas to pebbles to fists. Much of the congregation quickly retreated into the church, but I ran down the hill towards the exit from the churchyard. As I passed, the crowd had gathered around the farmhand. They paid me no mind. They were too busy shielding the fresh corpse with umbrellas. The storm that washed over the village was unlike anything I had witnessed before. 
I arrived back at my cottage wet and shivering and bruised. Not for a moment did the barrage of hail relent. None of it broke the skin, yet minutes after I found shelter beneath my tin roof, dark purple bruises of impact spread upon my arms and back. The cabin had sheltered me from many storms over the months, but this tempest seemed to be of a wholly different nature. The whole wooden structure vibrated under the relentless barrage of hail and wind. The calm stream in front of the cabin strengthened into a wild river of mud, and my whole yard was swallowed up by the shards of ice. The mood felt decidedly apocalyptic, and I had no idea what to do. Standing anywhere near the windows felt hazardous, and no part of the creaky cabin felt particularly stable. Not knowing what else to do, I curled up beneath the winding staircase that led to the second floor of the cottage. It felt like the most stable part of the house, and the noise was the most bearable in that dusty corner. For a while, I just shivered, my mind blank with terror. Then, even though the pandemonium outside stayed the same, my breaths slowed. Past the sheer confusion from the storm, past the questions about the horrid Airbus, I found myself counting sheep. When I woke, I woke to complete darkness. Hunger and thirst quickly followed. Every muscle in my body roared with bruises, but after some groans and false starts, I managed to get up and locate the fridge. I found a Tupperware container with overcooked pasta. I was so groggy and hungry that I ate straight from the container. After the cold meal was done, I chased it with my last can of Coke. The storm had passed and only the hiss of the muddy river remained. With my immediate needs met, I found myself in a sense of dazed calm. Soon enough, however, my mind drifted back to the plane in its terrible roar. My phone read 15 minutes to 2 a.m. When I pulled my aching body up the staircase, I told myself that I would just take a shower, change into dry clothes, and lie down in bed. I told myself that I would wake up wiser, but deep inside I knew I wasn't going to sleep. I didn't shower. I simply put on dry clothes and made my way back down the stairs. Outside the sky had turned cloudless, and the moon shined just as bright as it did before. The stream, however, had grown wild. The water leaped up much higher than it ever had before and would occasionally splash into my front yard. All that divided me from the raging torrents below was a bridge that was rickety on the best of days. My flashlight shook as I crossed the rotting wood, yet I did not let myself think about the possibility of a collapse. I had more important things to worry about. I had the Airbus to consider. Perhaps if I raised my concerns with the veterinarian or even Mayor Halchin, they would be heard. The rest of the village, however, wouldn't believe anything without concrete evidence. The mere existence of the plane bothered me to no end, but I, I knew that if I was to get help in solving its mystery, I would need proof. So with a flashlight in one hand and a phone in the other, I made my way up the village road. It was one minute from the hour when I reached the courtyard. The spot of fence where the farmhand had landed in the morning was covered in a burlap sack. I did my best to force any questions of its contents out of my mind. Thoughts of the boy's body still being impaled on those metal spikes quickly became replaced with fevered questions about the flying machine. I kept my phone trained on the moon. Every neuron of my attention was focused on picking up any hint of that terrible sound, of seeing even the slightest shiver in the trees that would suggest the arrival of that horrible plane. Yet no precursors of horror manifested. All I could hear was the hush of the muddled river, and when the silhouettes of trees did sway, it was from the gentle forest breeze. I found myself wondering whether the plane was just a product of my imagination, whether I had simply gone mad out in the countryside. My worry for my sanity only lasted for a moment. There was a pile of manure further up the road, but the wind from the woods had brought it in an undeniable smell of forest. 
The hush of the wild stream went from a source of concern to a source of tranquility. The village was nothing but a little bastion of civilization in a valley of the incomprehensible. I was nothing but a little man trying to find reason in the face of nature. The plain was nothing but a figment of my imagination, I convinced myself. Spending months away from the comforts of the city life had just driven me a little bit mad. It was time for me to go back home and sleep in a bed. I scarcely made three steps when I heard it, though. I had started to believe that the visions of the Airbus were nothing but me going crazy in the woods, but the moment I heard the start of the rumble, I let go of those lies. The plane was real. The plane was real and it was approaching the village. The moment the machine emerged from the woods, I averted my eyes. It was much closer. It was much louder. The sight of its terrible silhouette was enough to make me hold down vomit and grit my teeth. Through my distress, I still managed to raise my shaking hand to the sky. As the phone captured the plane bathed in moonlight, it grew unbearably hot, but I kept my grip strong. The Airbus flew much, much lower than it did before. Its roar annihilated all other sounds from the universe. But past my panic, I could see the other cottage windows light up. I wasn't the only one who was a witness to this terrible machine, but not being alone in my horror did nothing to ease my anguish. For a mere moment, I thought I heard the sound of wood cracking, of something falling on the side of the church hill, yet the deafening sound of the dark plane's engine quickly rendered my surroundings irrelevant. As the Airbus passed over me, it felt as if my eyeballs were about to vibrate out of their sockets. It wasn't until the plane's roar started to subside that I noticed the fire. Half of the spire had been knocked to the ground below, and what was left of the church was on fire. The remnants of the spire were ablaze as well, yet the water-soaked earth had kept their light dim. The only bright fire on the ground was that of the burlap sack stretched across the iron fence. My hopes of recording the dark machine had proved futile. When the villagers spilled from their homes out onto the road, my phone was hot and dark and refused to turn on. I had no evidence of the plane knocking down the church's steeple. The blaze at the top of the churchyard hill attracted immediate attention. Yet as the villagers, armed with buckets of water, sobered from their sleep, the futility of their fight became apparent. It would take at least a half an hour for a fire truck to arrive. No amount of buckets could stop the blaze atop the hill. I tried explaining to the gathered mob that I had seen the plane, that I had witnessed the crash and had no doubts about what had caused it. My testimony, however, soon became just another theory. Even though the storm had long passed, some considered the crash a freak lightning strike. Other, much more fanatical voices considered the collapsed steeple and blaze another sign that the Lord had been displeased with the village. When I told them that they were wrong, when I told them that I had witnessed the airplane with my own eyes, the crowd turned aggressive. I fled the churchyard, and once the roads became visible, I fled the village. There was no reasoning with the locals, and I fear that if I stayed there any longer, more of them would start to consider me the source of their misfortune. I write this as I sit on a high-speed train to the city. I do not know where I will sleep tonight, but I take solace in the idea that I will not be anywhere near that incomprehensible machine. I worry what will happen to that village tonight. I worry that that plane will flow lower once more and cause unspeakable suffering. Yet, as the train whizzes through the countryside that turns into small towns, that turns into cities, I find my mind calming. I am safe. I content myself on the idea that I am safe from the terrible plane. As the stations through which the train passes become familiar, however, I can't let go of this single sight. When the steeple first fell, as the villagers dashed up and down the hill with rusty buckets of water, I saw something. Out among the kindling that was once the top of the steeple, with burning straw for company and its white feathers caked in mud and blood, I saw a dead stork. It had a garden snake in its mouth.
They say the ladder festival started off as a singing contest back in the days of the Empire. Once a year, in a certain meadow at around midnight, the villagers would gather. Each village would send out a team of three young men carrying a ladder to represent them. Two men would hold the ladder upright, and the third would climb to the top of it and sing the songs of his people. If the singer couldn't bounce on top of the ladder, they would receive a disqualification along with whatever injuries the fall would cause. Those that had decent balance would be judged on their singing talent by the crowds. The best singer would bring glory to their village, and would be honoured by all until the next ladder festival. Or at least that's what the folks say. I'm sure a historian could paint you a better picture than me. I'm only familiar with the modern version of the ladder festival. The ladder game. The game is played a couple times a year, there's not much rhyme or reason to the timing, but a shared ladder game WhatsApp group always gives ample warning and taunts those who refuse to join. The players don't meet in a meadow, they meet at one of the dead stretches of road between the villages. Three guys, a ladder, and a truck. Two guys still hold a ladder, and one still climbs, but that's where the resemblance to the ladder festival ends. There's no singing involved in the ladder game. Folks just jump into the back of the truck, hold on for their lives, and ride. As you might have guessed, the police are no fans of the ladder game. A bunch of folk died in the 90s, and very specific laws were put on the books to dissuade future generations from playing the game. The moral panic had faded over the past 20 years, and all players were able to avoid death or injuries obvious enough to arouse suspicion. But aside from the players, no spectators are allowed to attend the ladder game. That is... Unless you're me. My pops is an electrical engineer, and my ma works in a cheese factory. But I'm related to village nobility. My cousin is known as the reigning champion of the ladder game. His Christian name is Yan, and he's been baptized in the water of legends as Jabba, the frog. Most say the nickname was born on his first ride. Some suggest it was a second or third. Either way, near the start of his ladder game career, my cousin's foot slipped during the ascent to the top rung of the ladder. Instead of crashing down to the ground, Yan managed to make a landing on one of the nearby trees. Against the advice of everyone present, Yan jumped back onto the ladder and insisted the game continue. Many claim he was drunk. A few say he was blindfolded. All will agree that he leaped like a frog. Regardless of the details, from that night onwards, my cousin was solely known as Jabba. The ladder game was a strictly secret affair. Every extra soul could mean the cops showing up and ruining the festivities. Regular spectators were forbidden from attending the ladder game. Any kin of Jabba's, however, was welcome to watch. So, I did. Jabba was just a couple years older than me, but I never met him in school. My cousin dropped out the moment it became a legal possibility and took a job hauling at the factory. Occasionally, my mother would mention my cousin as a sort of parable about why I should study harder. Yet those were the sort of stories that get nodded off and forgotten. Until I worked a summer at the cheese factory, I had no idea I even had a cousin. He was tall and lean, and perpetually unkempt. No one at the factory paid him any attention, and he didn't stand out. My cousin would just haul, smoke outside, and haul some more. I scarcely paid attention to him. He was just another working adult to me. Then, one day, coming out of the factory, he approached me. My cousin had left work at noon that day, and the stench coming off of him left no illusions about how he spent his free time. Reeking like a distillery with a hand-rolled cigarette in his mouth, he asked me if I knew about the ladder game. I told him I didn't. He said he would show me. I know getting into cars with drunk drivers is a terrible idea, but the road to the ladder game is always paved with poor judgement. Yam picked me up from my house well after midnight, and seemed no more sober than he did in the evening. As he drove, my cousin did his best to explain the ladder game, but no words, drunken or sober, could do justice to the real thing. Every time that I have witnessed the ladder game, four villages were represented. The Poles, from across the border, the Dead Enders, from the village where the road finished, the Parrots, from the fake village where everyone pretended to be city folk, and us, the Cheesemen. The gathering looked like a drunken surge pie for a dead kid. 
The night was black and the only thing that cut through it were the headlights of the gathered cars and the wild stars above. Off in the darkness, dirty reflectors gave vague suggestions of the road where the game would be taking place. There definitely was a cheery mood among the contestants and drivers when we arrived, but the moment my cousin stepped into the light, the excitement of the gathering reached a fevered pitch. The crowd celebrated the arrival of their hero, and when my cousin introduced me as his kin, they celebrated me as well. When I asked why everyone was calling my cousin the frog, I was treated to a dramatic rendition of the legend by one of the parrots. I would come to hear that story every ladder game. It would never be the same. It would always differ on the details, but my cousin would always nod along. The details didn't matter. What mattered was the myth of Jabba. The first contestants of the ladder game that night were the parrots. The city boys visiting for the summer managed to climb up easily enough, but when he reached the upper rungs of the moving ladder, his grip slipped. Luckily, the city boy landed in the nearby grass instead of the rough asphalt or the dirt. He didn't die, his injuries weren't too obvious, and he could still walk, albeit with a limp. The parrots did retreat back to their village after the fall, but they did so in reasonably good cheer. No lasting damage had been done. Everyone seemed to be in good spirits, but my cousin took great offence to the fall. Jabba insisted that his team be the next to compete. No one gathered resisted. Soon enough, my cousin and the two sons of the village butcher jumped into the back of their truck and proceeded to illustrate the proper way to play the ladder game. The parrot's ascent was impressive in its own right, but Jabba blew the city kid's acrobatics out of the water. My cousin climbed to the top of the ladder with lightning speed, and when there was no space left to climb, he planted his feet on the top rung and extended his arms to his side like the big man from the church. Where Jesus was a suffering martyr, however, Jabba was a wild manifestation of adrenaline fueled joy. He stood atop the ladder with his arms outstretched, howling to the sky like a wolf who had just found his plump prey. I watched this display of ecstasy sitting on the hood of the Polish truck. I didn't understand my drinking companion, but the sliver of its helped bridge the divide. As my cousin screamed through the star-filled sky, I asked the pole the question that had been on my mind all night. How does one win the ladder game? The pole took a swig at the bottle and pointed at my cousin. The sliver of its dueled most of my memory that night, but what I recall with burning intensity is my cousin's descent from the ladder. He came down wild-eyed and sweaty and with a burning hand-rolled cigarette in his mouth. He raved to all present about the beauty of the night air, about the intoxicating nature of standing on the edge. The Jabba preached the gospel of the ladder game to a ravenous crowd of followers. I soon found myself a convert. It was surreal seeing Jabba at work Monday morning. He descended from the realm of a living god to that of a mere mortal. What was even more disturbing is he didn't seem to care at all. When the other workers pushed him around and chastised him for being too slow, he simply shrugged and moved on. He knew he was something more beyond the confines of the cheese factory. So did I. It wasn't until I'd visited a couple ladder games that my cousin entertained the idea. My voice had turned deep and the hair was starting to spring up above my lip. I was grown enough to start thinking about becoming a man. To my cousin and all his friends, there was only one way to end a childhood. So I trained. I climbed a ladder near the old barn with zealous discipline, and I stayed sober during every ladder game I visited, just so all the mistakes and techniques would stay cemented in my mind. I watched a lot of accidents, but the thought of backing away from the game never even crossed my mind. For each broken bone I witnessed, I witnessed plenty of soft falls that avoided the power lines. The memories of all accidents were washed away by Jabba's ladder-side sermons. I watched and I climbed and I prepared for the day that I would feel the night flow through my hair. I thought that by imitating my cousin I would get to taste the joy that flowed through his blood whenever he stepped off the ladder. When the moment to climb the ladder finally arrived last night, I got what I was promised. Last night, I tasted the forbidden fruit that my cousin would get so intoxicated on. Had that been the only thing that happened, I would look back at last night with joy. Yet, last night, I witnessed much more than just the rush of the ladder game. It's been a strange week. My induction into the ladder game was meant to take place this summer, 
but since one of the butcher boys got arrested on Monday, my initiation was expedited. I was to become the second ladder holder for the cheese men, but no one was allowed to hold a ladder if they didn't climb it. I didn't feel ready, Mujaba said I was. I didn't question his expertise. In the days leading up to the ladder game, there were rumours of the parrots hearing strange noises in the night, and the dead enders spoke of snakes falling from the sky in their village. The rumours didn't help my nerves, but strange tales are pretty standard in the countryside. The night before the ladder game, I woke up to the sounds of unearthly thunder, but I was far too sleepy to make sense of it. It wasn't until the morning that the terror had reached me. A storm swept through the hills, a storm filled a fist-sized hail and chilling gusts and enough rain to turn the fields into mud. The storm dragged on into the afternoon and didn't die off until sundown. I was still scared of the wind or hail making a return when I was suspended in the air, but it wasn't until the contestants converged that true fear struck me. Only one of the dead enders showed. The first had stayed at home in shock. The other had slipped from a ladder while checking the dead end church for stork nests. He was dead, impaled on the metal fence of the church. The parrots didn't show at all, presumably because of the storm but their absence meant nothing to me. The dead, dead ender was enough of an omen already. The one farmhand that showed suggested that the game be postponed to another day, and I was more than partial to the idea. Jabba, however, refused outright. The latter game had never been postponed before, and it would not be postponed tonight. Additionally, the one dead ender was not allowed to leave. He would help hold the ladder with one of the poles as Jabba drove. I was to become a man before sunrise. It was terrifying to disagree with Jabba, terrifying enough that I eventually relented. In my protest, however, the poll suggested they go first, and give me some time to gather my thoughts. Jabba, eventually, agreed. Aside from one particular wobble that put the ladder rider on a near imminent collision course with a power line, the polls performed adequately. I was scarcely able to watch though, all I could pay attention to was how sweaty my palms were getting. I was not ready to climb the ladder, but I knew I couldn't turn back. Once I knew I would one day climb the ladder, I stayed sober at all the games. I knew all my brain power to observe. That fateful night, however, it only took one look at the den ender who would be holding my ladder to make me reach for the sliver of its bottle. The guy's friend was dead, and he was clearly shaken by the tragedy. I didn't trust him to keep me in the air. The pole in charge of the other side of the ladder seemed stable enough, and the sharp sliver of it helped loosen me up, but my hands shook as I placed them on the ladder. The moment had come. Jabba was behind the wheel, and the engine of the truck was coughing awake. My body refused to move, but with a couple of sharp words of encouragement from my cousin, I found my feet standing on wood. The first couple of steps passed by in an instant, it wasn't until I was high enough to crack my skull that my knees started to shake. The road beneath us was slick with rain, and even though I couldn't see the dead ender's face, his mere presence made me nervous. My hands wrapped around the ladder in an iron grip and refused to move any further. I was sure the only way my body could climb would be down, which Jabba pressed down on the gas pedal spurred me into ascent. The faster the truck was moving, the more dangerous the ladder game would become. Jabba wouldn't let the game finish halfway through. I gathered all the courage I had and continued to climb. I kept my eyes locked on the rungs of the ladder and simmered down all my thoughts into mechanical commands. I was going to get to the top of the ladder as quickly as possible just so I could get my feet back on the ground. The adrenaline kept me quick all the way to the top. I was a creature with a singular purpose. But then, my hands slowed. That elusive thing that Jabba rambled about over liquor and cigarettes. That frigid night wind. The wild stars above. That thin line between life and death. The purpose of the ladder game. It all hit me like a brick, but I kept my balance. I kept my balance and gripped the wood and howled like a mad wolf. Down below, the horn of the truck harmonized with me. For a fleeting moment, I felt utter rapture. Then my body jerked to the right. It was a slight movement, barely noticeable, 
but when you're bouncing near power lines, you tend to be hyper aware. I looked down, my hyper vigilance proved to be well founded. Down below, for a mere moment, I saw the dead ender let go of the ladder. Only the pole remained to keep me stable. You did a poor job. It all happened in an instant. One moment I was slightly off balance and the next I was flying through the air. Before the terror of landing on the asphalt hit me, something else did. A branch. One moment I was clutching to the ladder and the next I was clutching the limb of an old beech tree. The wood had knocked the wind out of me and my face was bleeding from getting acquainted with small branches. But I was alive. Jabba drove the truck back around and kept on insisting that I jump back on the ladder as he once did. I never talked back to my cousin, but I had no interest in leaping through the night. All I wanted to do was get my feet back on solid ground. Against my cousin's wishes, the pole jumped off the truck and provided a ladder for my descent. Jabba was furious that I did not follow in his footsteps. I feared that my cousin would swing at me, but his rage was mainly directed at the dead ender who dropped me. Immediately, Jabba punched the farmman square in the nose. The dead ender tried explaining that he had heard something from beyond the hills that terrified him. But Jabba was deaf to his explanation. He simply kept throwing punches until the dead ender ran off into the night. The pole that had held the other side of the ladder insisted that the ladder game be brought to a close. As did his two compatriots. As did I. Had our pleas been heard, the night would have probably ended much differently. Jabba, however, refused to bring the game to a close. He wanted to show us how the real ladder game is to be played. I felt like I had been run over by a car, but I was not allowed to leave or even sit down. Jabba wanted me to hold onto the ladder with the other cheesemen and one of the poles would drive. No one wanted to take part in the last ride, especially not me, yet no resistance was put up. Out on those dark roads, the Jabba's word would always be law. I never held a ladder before, but my mind was far too disturbed by my fall to feel nervous. I just clutched the wood as hard as I could and focused on keeping completely still. I did not watch my cousin climb, but within seconds, his voice was distant enough to suggest he reached the top of the ladder. He was ordering the pole to drive faster, he was ordering us to look up and witness him. That's when the rumble in the distance started. The sound was familiar. It was the exact strange thunder I had heard the night before the storm. But it was louder. Both me and my other ladder holder shouted at my cousin to come back down. In response, all the Jabba did was laugh. He wasn't going to let a little bit of rain end his fun. Only idiots were scared of thunder, he yelled. Jabba thought he was defying the weather, but it quickly became clear. But it was not ordinary thunder that we were hearing. The roar rolled through the hills until it became deafening enough to overpower my cousin's howls. It wasn't thunder. I had spent my whole life in the village and encountered all sorts of bad weather, but I never heard anything like it. There was an unnatural metallic tinge to it. It sounded less like a thunderclap and more like the roar of some massive engine. I wanted to look up at the source of the sound, but my eyes wouldn't let me. All I saw was a flash of two blood red lights and the silhouette of something huge. A terrible pain shot through my eyes to the back of my skull. The butcher's boy was just as panicked as I was. The pole even stopped the truck, but Jabba did not come down. The noise became unbearable. Its mere presence was so loud that I felt like I was going deaf. Something was moving right above us, but my body refused to witness it. All I could do was stare at my feet and grip the ladder with every bit of concentration I had. The light of the moon became obscured and my feet were planted into complete darkness. Something above me moved. Something above me moved, but my neck refused to look up. All I could do was stare at my feet and pray for the terror to come to an end. The roar from the sky never fully disappeared, but once it had faded enough to allow the rest of the world to exist, I was spurred back into reality. I heard the crackling of flames above me. I looked up, expecting to see my cousin standing atop the ladder, but I did not see him. The top of the ladder was snapped away, and what was left of it was burning. Bits of flaming wood hissed in the wet grass nearby, and about a dozen meters away from the car, 
sat another pile of flames. By the time the paramedics arrived, the body was unidentifiable, but they took our word for it. My cousin had died the same way he had lived, on top of a ladder. The mechanisms of his death, however, were a complete mystery. The authorities had decided that he fell into the power lines. I insisted that he did not. My cousin was nowhere near the power lines, and he wouldn't fall from the ladder. He was Jabba. What killed him wasn't a misstep. What killed him did not come from this world. Something had hit him up there. Something big and loud and hot enough to set his body on fire. In response, the cops threatened me with a breathalyzer. Their power line explanation made no sense, but they insisted upon it. No negotiation was permitted. I was the last one to accept that version of events. I put up resistance to the official story all the way until the police drove me home. It wasn't until my father, drowsy with sleep, sat down with me that I relented. He said nothing good comes from the ladder game. He also reminded me of the multitude of laws that existed to prevent the youth from engaging in the forbidden sport. I was lucky I didn't get arrested. Whatever had happened, he said, was better left unexplored. I wager he is right. I wager he is right, but the questions keep eating away at me. They keep eating away at me, and I reckon they always will. That terrible engine sound is still scratching through my ears, and I can still feel the wood of the ladder against my palms. I just hope that with time, the memory will pass. I also hope that whatever my cousin met up there, whatever terrible machine flew through the sky and ended his life, I hope it never comes back. Had he lived beyond the Iron Curtain, my uncle would have spent most of his life in a mental asylum. In communist Czechoslovakia, however, mental asylums primarily served as a means of punishing political opposition, so my uncle was relatively free. Well, for most of his life, at least. Rural life doesn't really lend itself to the nuances of mental health, so no one dwelt too far into his peculiarities. He was never formally diagnosed with anything, and I wouldn't dare to try to play doctor, but rest assured, he was far from stable. The village just considered him crazy and left it at that. Well, for most of his life at least. There was a horseshoe-shaped scar right above his eye. When I was a kid, I presumed he was strange because of that scar. But decades later, in hushed whispers after family reunions, I would find out my uncle was born strange. As a child, he would walk out onto the hill at the edge of the forest and howl at the moon like a rabid animal. He shunned the regular toy trains and wooden soldiers that the other boys would play with and instead made his own dolls of sticks and straw. Once he was old enough not to require constant supervision, my uncle would disappear into the forest for days on end and would only return back to the village for food and water. When, in his late teens, my uncle arrived at the breakfast table with blood dripping down his forehead, his parents just assumed he had gone out on another misadventure. The boy was strange, but he was not deemed dangerous. As cryptic as his speech was, as incomprehensible as his behavior was, the village had agreed that he was harmless. The boy was strange, but he would never hurt a living soul. Until the autumn of 78, that notion held true. Much of my early childhood was spent following my uncle around the village. While his erratic behavior was a cause for concern among most of the village, I found him fascinating. While the other adults in my life wanted to lecture me on cleanliness and how a young man should act, my uncle would tell me strange fairy tales about the magical creatures of the forest. The Vodniks, the Bogyanki, the Baba Yaga, my uncle would fill my head with tales of fantastic beasts that roamed beyond the confines of the village. The talk of responsibility and cleanliness that all the adults in my life would subject me to was senseless noise compared to the mysterious sermons my uncle would impart on me. In 74 or 75, my great-grandfather died. A couple of months after the village funeral, much of the family loaded themselves into their trabants and ladas and drove out to Poprad, the nearest city where the inheritance proceedings would take place. 
even though my uncle had a downright antagonistic relationship with cars, when it came time to depart, he pushed me over to the middle seat and joined in on the ride. The man never shaved. For most of the drive through the hills, his unkept beard kept on rubbing against my face. I distinctly remember being irritated at the prospect of having to ride between him and my grandmother. My face itched and I was angry about not being consulted on the seating arrangements in the car, but by the time we arrived in the city, my spirits calmed. My family promised the solemn reading of the will. My uncle promised to stroll around the city. I chose my uncle. While my parents got ready for the reading of the will and arguments over who inherits what land, me and my uncle set out off on a walk to the center square. At least, that's what he announced to the family. Our course quickly changed. The main square of Poprad was filled with all sorts of fantastic things a village boy might find amusing, but my uncle had other plans. He led me out of the center towards a roadway. The cement houses that surrounded the road proved to be of some interest, but after a while they disappeared as well. All that was left was a busy road surrounded by fields. For what felt like an eternity, we dodged cars with nothing to shield us from the summer sun. I was starting to grow frustrated with my uncle again, I even started to complain about my legs hurting. But before my frustration manifested into a childish outburst, the true destination of my uncle's pilgrimage was revealed. The Poprad Airport. I wasn't raised under a rock. I watched cartoons. I knew planes existed. I just never saw one in the flesh. Decades down the line, I would become an aerospace engineer. The moment clearly had an impact. That initial burst of pure fascination of seeing a real flying machine will stick with me till the day I die. But it will always be tainted by what my uncle said to me. My uncle grabbed me by the shoulders and pointed towards the airfield. With utter disgust and rage in his voice, he told me that The devil drives one of those machines. You have to keep an eye on them. Over the years, I had chosen to forget about my uncle's inexplicable hatred of planes and just focused on the moment when I fell in love with engineering. Yet over the past couple of days, I have thought long and hard about what he had said that summer afternoon. I've also been thinking a lot about the holy water incident of Autumn 78. The construction of the new fire station was the most interesting thing to happen in a village all year. The rickety church would still be the highest building in the village, but it would only retain its position because it stood on top of a hill. The two-story cement structure grew day by day, and even half finished, it managed to dwarf all the cottages around it. That autumn, I spent every afternoon at my great-grandfather's grave. My parents thought I sat by the tombstone because of some sudden burst of filial piety and they relaxed their stances on chores in response. Truthfully, I just sat there for a good view of the fledgling fire station. Watching the building be constructed in individual steps from the metal scaffolding to the mixing of cement was utterly fascinating to 12-year-old me. It was during one of my afternoon observation sessions that the holy water incident took place. I was watching the workers mix cement to fill up the metal skeleton of the second floor when the doors of the church burst open. Out came running my uncle, with a jug of water cradled in his arms. After him, flustered and red in the face, came the village priest. Behind the sprinting priest, peeking out of the church doors like nervous sheep, came the attendants of afternoon mass. The construction of the new fire station was the most interesting thing to happen in the village all year, but the holy water incident quickly overshadowed anything that had happened all decade. My uncle dashed down the church hill towards the construction, gripping the stolen jug of holy water. A handful of workers were attending to the cement mixer, but with savage shouts, my uncle dissolved their huddle. With the intensity of a firefighter at an ammunition depot, my uncle started to pour holy water into the cement mixer. The priest was beside himself with zealous rage, but the man of cloth wouldn't touch my uncle. One of the construction workers, however, unbound by oaths of non-violence, tried to intervene. He grabbed my uncle by the shoulders and tried to pull him away from the cement mixer so that the holy water would not be squandered. My uncle had never been a violent man. It was perhaps because of his harmless nature that the village tolerated his bizarre behavior. My uncle had never been a violent man, but when the construction worker attempted to stop him from pouring the holy water into the cement, he turned around and planted his fist straight into the construction worker's nose. The impact of the punch could be heard from atop the church hill. 
The construction worker reeled back from the hits and landed straight on his ass in the gravel. As the man in dirty overalls collected the blood from his bleeding nose, my uncle finished off what he set off to do. He poured the rest of the water into the cement mixer and then, when the holy jug was empty, he screamed a cry of victory. Charcoal! He yelled. Charcoal for the long winter! Back then, those words meant nothing to me. My uncle continued to scream about the charcoal until the workmen restrained him. Had he punched one of the villagers, the issue would have ended there. My uncle would be chastised for his behavior, perhaps beaten a bit, and then he would be left to his own strange ways. My uncle, however, did not punch some unimportant hick. He punched an out-of-towner who came in to help with the construction. This out-of-towner also happened to be a good friend of the head of the fire safety committee. He was not going to let his broken nose go unpunished. The police arrived shortly before sunset. By the time the sky was dark, my uncle was gone. They say he died of pneumonia in prison a couple of years later, but no one really bothered to check. Once my uncle was driven out of the village, his existence fell comfortably into the realm of myth. People would occasionally mention him at family reunions, but he was more of a punchline than a human being by then. The crazy uncle. The crazy uncle we don't talk about much. He slipped my mind too. For a couple of weeks after the holy water incident, I was curious about his fate, about why he would pour holy water into a cement mixer, about the charcoal for the long winter. Yet soon enough, those questions were buried beneath the universal blues of puberty. By the time I got out of high school, I scarcely remembered I even had a crazy uncle. I studied engineering in Prague, and when the Bolshevik system collapsed halfway through my studies, I fought tooth and nail to move to the West. I finished off my masters in Delft and then, through a lucky set of coincidences, ended up flying across the ocean to Arlington. I spent most of my life in the US, away from my roots. I got married, had kids, got divorced, and worked myself to the bone in the process. When my father died, my schedule was far too hectic to make the flight back home. All I managed to do was to sit by his grave overlooking the now defunct fire station. My father was gone and, after a week or so of visiting, I found my mother on her way as well. I didn't show up for my flight back to the States. Instead, I stayed in the village where I was born. The first couple of weeks were confusing. The village was much smaller than it was in my memories of youth. Everything was quieter, more peaceful, and when night came the darkness was so total I felt like I could grip it in my fist. The once mighty fire station had become an empty building that served as a makeshift town hall and a place to have funeral receptions. The only thing that didn't seem to have aged was the rickety church, and that was just because if it got any more unstable, it would collapse. After the disorienting arrival, I adjusted to my new rural life. My mother was confined to her bed, so I spent most of my time in a cottage tending to her or listening through the many books I promised myself I would read after I retired. They start to blur into each other, and I found myself much calmer than I had been in decades. Rural life had turned out to be rather blissful. Then, a snake fell from the sky. Brona Halchin, the mother of the mayor, reported one day that a snake fell on top of her as she was making her way up the church hill. She was much older than my mother, but Verona's religious zeal and need to be the center of attention kept her animated well past her years. The mayor's mother claimed that the snake had been a punishment from God. The village veterinarian claimed that the snake was probably just some bird's dinner. The mayor claimed that the snake issue would be addressed. I did not busy myself with the snake affair. My mother's health had deteriorated to the point where I would wake up in the middle of the night in fear that she had died. I was more concerned with the impending funeral arrangements than a snake in the churchyard. It was during one of my paranoid middle of the night wake ups, however, that I found something new to worry about. Must have been around 2 in the morning. I found myself sweating in bed and my mother's snoring had gone worryingly silent. I made my way over to her room to find her lying on her side, still alive and quietly breathing. That's when I heard that terrible sound. It started off as a quiet rumble but quickly gained in dark tenor. Soon enough the whole cottage was shaking. Somewhere above us something terrible moved. It sounded like thunder amplified through a metal cave. The terrible noise was unlike anything I had ever heard before, and its mere presence made any thought impossible. 
It wasn't until Dark Roar had fizzled off into the distance that I realized that the noise sounded strangely familiar. I just couldn't place my finger on it. My mother had been hard of hearing for years now. She slept through the deafening roar and, when I asked her about it in the morning, she excused it as a simple thunderstorm somewhere off in the distance. Her explanation didn't calm me. In the evening, once my mother had gone to sleep, I found myself in need of company and a drink. Off in a village pub, the air was rife with discussion about more alleged snake sightings. Some claimed the snakes were a sign of divine judgment. Others claimed that there was a stork nest in the steeple of the church. All were very convinced of their theories. The discussion was losing in its civility and threatened to burst into violence. Yet before fists and chairs started getting thrown around, Mayor Halchin banged on the table and demanded calm. The steeple of the church would be inspected on the following morning. All discussion of snakes was to cease till then. In the brief silence between the shouts, I thought of bringing up the strange howl I had heard in the night. But before I did, someone beat me to it. The city kid spoke up. We had both moved to the village around the same time, but I had roots. He didn't. The kid asked about the strange noise in the night, and all he received from the table were stares. Halchin told him it was just thunder. The rest of the table murmured in approval. The kid didn't take it. He said he saw a glimpse of the thing. Something had flown above the village. The kid started saying something about the thing shining with red light, but before he could get into any proper descriptions, Halchin stopped him in his tracks. It was thunder, Halchin reminded him. The sound the boy had heard was thunder and any further discussion was spreading panic just like the snake talk. He was told, in no uncertain terms, that his further input on the subject was not welcome. I had grown up around Halchin and knew not to contradict them. The kid didn't seem to need the years of experience. He knew to stay quiet as well. After the mayor had shut him up, the kid finished off his drink and left. I was happy I didn't bring up the sound myself. Eventually, with a couple of drinks, I convinced myself that Halchin had been right. All I heard was some far-off thunder. At least, that's what I told myself. I couldn't fall asleep that night. I had drunk enough to become sluggish, and my internal monologue had descended from words into vague notions, but consciousness refused to depart. I laid in bed, listening to my mother's strange snoring, trying to remember why the sound I had heard the night prior sounded so familiar. My mind was far too dull to even properly recall the sound, but by the time the bedside alarm clock creeped towards 2am, it was no longer necessary. The sound was back. As if it had been tied to my mother's snores, it slowly crawled into reality. The roar above grew louder and louder until everything else ceased to exist. The windows of the cottage shook. My face grew numb. Everything in the world descended into nothingness to make room for that deafening sound. Perhaps because of exhaustion, perhaps because of fear, I couldn't bring myself to get out of bed. I laid under my covers with my eyes wide open, staring at the ceiling, trying to fully concentrate on that terrible sound outside. Well before the noise reached its deafening zenith, I placed it. It was unlike any engine I had ever witnessed. It was much louder and darker than anything I had encountered in the decade of my career, but the noise was unmistakable. A plane was flying at an extremely low altitude above me. I wanted to get up to look at what sort of engine could produce such a horrid sound, yet lying in that bed I found myself paralyzed. The roar in the skies above, even muffled by the walls of my wooden childhood home, was so loud it made my teeth chatter. All notion of physical strength drained from my body, and I was left motionless in bed. When the roar finally died down, when the night settled and all I could hear was the bubbling of the far off stream and the snoring of my aged mother, I put on my shoes and walked outside. Somewhere off in the distance, that terrible sound still rumbled, but aside from the burning moon, the sky was clear. Standing there, Searching the night sky for hints of a plane, my uncle's words crashed into my internal monologue. The devil drives one of those machines. You have to keep your eyes on him. There was a terrible storm the following day. Hail the size of fists dropped from the sky and the gentle bubbling stream that led through the village threatened to turn into a flooding river. I had spent the whole day inside, tending to my mother. 
but later I would find out that there had been a death at the church. A farmhand had been sent up to the steeple to check if a stork had made a nest there, but during his ascent the wind had shifted and the ladder he was climbing turned loose. The farmhand met his end against the metal fence of the church. His death was not quick. On any other occasion, the death of the farmhand would have overshadowed all happenings in the village for weeks. The events the following night, however, pushed the youth's death into obscurity. My mother had gone to sleep well before midnight. I was alone in the cottage, sitting by the window and occasionally watching the clock sluggishly turn closer to 2 a.m. All that kept me company was her snoring, but beyond the glass I could see that other cottages were lit up as well. The storm had prevented me from talking to other villagers about the roaring jet engine, but it was clear others were awaiting its return as well. We all sat around our windows, expecting answers. Instead of clarity, however, the village received destruction. I spent hours waiting by the window just so that I could see the source of that deafening sound. The closer the clock got to two, the more my knees started to ache. Something deep inside of me knew that what was hiding behind that window was best unseen. By the time the rumbling started off beyond the hills, I had to grip the windowsill to stay upright. My teeth clenched and my eyeballs bulged and I had to press my face against the glass, but I saw it. For a mere collection of seconds that will forever be scarred into my memory, I saw it. It was unlike any plane I had ever witnessed. Whatever make the Airbus was, it was bigger than anything I'd ever worked with or seen. If you took the Antonov, painted it jet black, and then pushed its size to the very limits of aerodynamics, and then pushed a bit further, that's how big the plane above was. On its massive wings sat two blood-red lights that shot tendrils of pain from my eyeballs to the back of my skull. Every moment I spent looking at the machine, I could feel my sanity slipping away. I did not last at the window for long. Soon enough, I was curled up on the floor, with my palms shielding my ears. Before my body gave out, however, I noticed the most horrid thing of all. The plane was flying dangerously low. The plane was flying dangerously low and heading straight for the steeple of the church. Beyond the metal screech, I could not hear the impact. I could not hear anything. The universe distilled itself into cacophony and only a single thought, a single memory broke through. The devil drives in one of those machines. You have to keep an eye on him. Well, after the noise had rumbled off beyond the valley, I was still lying on the floor. My mind had been completely sandblasted by fear and every inch of my body felt foreign. It wasn't until I heard shouts from the outside that I managed to crawl to my knees. The church had indeed been hit. The steeple had been knocked down and reduced into nothing but kindling that burned over the graves. The rest of the church was also burning. It was as if the plane had sparked the fire itself. The sight of the Eldritch Airbus had been enough to drive me to the floor, but the fire had brought me back to my senses. Without much conscious thoughts, I pulled on my shoes and ran to the old barn in search of buckets. Dozens of villagers helped. Quickly, we organized into a chain of young and old and strong and weak, but our efforts did nothing to stem the blaze. It would take a solid hour for a fire truck to make its way through the winding hills of the valley. Well before the flashing lights appeared, there was nothing left of the church worth saving. When the bucket party had given up, chaos spread through the crowd. The city kid, the one that had first talked about the howl of the plane at the pub, he claimed he had taken a video of the crash. His phone, however, had shorted out and refused to turn back on. I had seen the plane. Others who had waited with their lights turned on had seen the plane as well. In the chaos, we did our best to support his claims, but our voices were quickly drowned out. Verona Halchin had seized the narrative and started to preach. There had been no plane, she swore. What we had witnessed was a strike of God. He had started with snakes dropped from the sky, then he brought down a mighty storm, and now, at the zenith of his rage, he had struck down the steeple of the church. Her fervor quickly shifted from abstract accusations of godlessness to finger pointing. She said it was the kid and other outsiders who had tainted the village. There were voices of reason in the crowd, but they were few. With the church still burning and the crowd wild with panic, Verona's words turned to absolute fury. The kid quickly fled. Fearing that Verona would search for a new scapegoat, I made my exit as well. 
When I returned home, I was shocked to learn that my mother had slept through the entire affair. Even as the sirens of the overdue fire truck arrived by the church, her heavy snores scarcely changed in rhythm. I did not wake her up that night. I feared that the sudden shock might push her to the grave and, even if her heart could handle being pulled out of slumber, I couldn't imagine how I would explain what had happened to her. The roar from the sky was much louder than it had been the night previous. With each passing sunset, the plane got closer and closer to the village. The airbus had cut through the church steeple as if it was a tower of toothpicks. I dreaded to think what would happen the following night. When my mother awoke, I brought her breakfast and tea to bed. I had no idea how to broach the subject of the low-flying airplane. At first, I tried to find a way to transition from our casual morning chat to the impending danger. But when no obvious path presented itself, I simply came out with it. I told my mother that an incomprehensible jet had crashed into the steeple of the church. Tonight, I told her it would fly much lower and create untold suffering. It was time for us to leave the village. My mother took the confusing news with nothing but a twitch of the eyebrow. When I told her about the church, when I insisted that we get in a car and drive to the city, when I told her we were in danger, she simply shook her head. Wordlessly, she pushed away her plates, climbed out of bed, and shuffled her way over to the window. When she was still able to climb the church hill, my mother had been a religious person. She had never missed Sunday Mass, and whenever anyone in the family was making a change in career or undergoing surgery, she would provide nightly prayers to hedge bets with the Almighty. Seeing the burnt-down husk of the village church that morning, however, elicited no emotion from the woman. She simply gazed out of the window and then, almost in a whisper, said, Charcoal for the long winter. My mother wasn't looking at the church. She was looking at the old fire station. When I asked her to repeat herself, she acted as if she said nothing at all. I asked about my uncle, about the charcoal, about the planes, yet all she did was shake her head and pity her poor brother's soul. Then, she quickly changed the topic of conversation. She was going to cook lunch. I was to bring her some wood from the stove. I made a couple of weak attempts at salvaging the mystery of my uncle, but my mother pretended she couldn't hear me. The thought of staying in the village despite the imminent danger was undeniably absurd, but I knew the old woman wouldn't get into my car willingly. When I went outside with the wood basket, it started to snow. As we ate lunch, she talked a lot more than usual. My mother had always been chatty, but age had slowed her down. By the time I had arrived in the village, it was clear my mother had become unaccustomed to conversation. As we dug into the goulash though, my mother's sentences connected and she even seemed animated. She spoke of my childhood and my dad and other family members no longer present. She even mentioned her brother. She asked if I remember how scruffy his beard was. I was happy to see my mother so animated, but I had to ask. As I brought up the airplane and the charcoal and the water spilled into the cement mixer, her face softened. This time she didn't pretend she didn't hear me. She shook her head and smiled and told me everything would be okay. There was something in her voice that made me believe her. By the time we finished off lunch, the world beyond the window was white. My mother's post-lunch nap quickly turned into a deep sleep, and I went to chop some wood. With my head full of memories, I drifted into the sunset. Well before two, I was sitting vigil. Just after sunset, a handful of cars made their exit from the village. Each pair of passing headlights nudged me towards the idea of escape, yet I knew it was already too late. The hill roads that led back to civilization were already dangerous to drive through the day. Setting out after dark was suicide. So, I waited. With my mother snoring in the other room and the moonlit world covered in snow, I waited for the plane to arrive. Beyond the window, other homes were lit up in anticipation. Knowing that I was not the only one awaiting the arrival of that incomprehensible machine made the minutes counting down to two almost tranquil. The first sign of that devilish rumble, however, wiped out all calmness from the world. My knees turned weak once more. All I wanted to do was to curl up and avert my gaze from the incoming terror. With every ounce of courage I had, I gripped the windowsill and kept my eyes locked onto the trees beyond. The moment the dark mammoth rose from behind the trees, a flurry of pain shot through the back of my skull. 
It felt like someone was putting out cigarettes against the back of my eyes. The engine of the devil's machine was so overpowering that my agonized screams were nothing but a gentle tone in the nether regions of my ears. Each second that I spent looking out of the window was tearing away at any conscious thought that was left in my brain, but I drove my fingers into the wood of the windowsill and kept myself on my feet. I watched the black airbus descend onto the village where I had spent my youth. I watched the black airbus head straight for the old fire station. The moment the plane's nose made direct contact with the cement structure, a brilliant light consumed the night. Sparks were flying everywhere. The roar of the engine whimpered away and was replaced with the screech of a thousand metal grinders. My eyes could handle the approach of the Airbus, but they could not withstand the impact. Drenched in tears, they gave out along with my knees. Lying on the floor of the cottage, the terror of the plane crash did not leave me. Every flicker of light that bounced from the window seemed to be ripping the air out of my lungs. In a state of utter panic, I grasped for breath and prayed that the world would return to normal. The cacophony lasted for what felt like an eternity. I was certain that my body would give out, that I would choke in the company of those horrid flashing lights. Yet, eventually, with sudden silence, the noise stopped. My eyes were drenched in tears, and every muscle in my body was shivering, but I managed to climb up to my knees and look out of the window. The plane was gone. The plane was gone, and the fire station still stood. Next to the cement building, blending into the moonlit night, sat a mountain of black. I scarcely registered the charcoal before my body gave up. I spent the whole night on the floor, drifting in and out of consciousness. Dreams never came, but when I did find myself in those brief moments of wakefulness, my body refused to get up. I lay on the floor the whole night, desperately assuring myself that I was still alive. The morning sun streaking in through the windows was a flickering candle compared to the sparks of the crash. Everything felt terribly distant and nonsensical. The universe in which an Airbus could dissipate against an old cement building felt far too incomprehensible to re-enter after my ordeal. It wasn't until I found my mother standing over me in the morning that feeling returned back to my limbs. She had started a fire in the stove and was getting ready to cook lunch. With the same tone that she would dictate chores to me as a child, she ordered me to go outside and gather some charcoal. If I wouldn't go soon, it would all be gone. I lacked all energy to argue or try to make sense of the world. I simply gathered the wood basket and went out into the snow. By the time I had made my way to the old fire station, the mountain of charcoal had turned into a hill. By the time we finished eating lunch, most of the stove fuel had been scavenged away. The whole affair still puzzles me. But after that one bright night, the Airbus never returned. I do not know what led my uncle to pour holy water into the cement mixer so many years ago. But I understand the purpose now. My strange uncle saved us. He saved the village from an incomprehensible machine that threatened to wipe the village off the map. He saved us and made sure we would be prepared for the long winter that was to come. I really, really, really want to put this behind me. I just want to wake up tomorrow morning and pretend that Lola died at a vet's office in Islamabad and move on with my life. The past 48 hours have been absolute hell and... Again, I want to move on. But I feel like I owe you guys an update. For those of you who are not familiar or forgot, I posted on here last night about Lola, my cat. I was moving from Islamabad to Prague for a teaching job, and shortly before my flight, Lola died. My airline wouldn't take her body, so I booked her a flight through Marana Air. When she arrived, she wasn't dead anymore. Well, it's not Lola. The body that the creature inhabits used to belong to my dear Lola. Of that, I am sure. 
But whatever came out of that animal carrier is not my cat. It howls in this horrid, dark way, and it, and it smells like rotting meat. My Lola died, and I was still growing to accept that. And suddenly, this horrible creature got thrust into my life. There were a couple nice comments when I originally told you my story, and I guess it's because of them that I'm back. But God damn it, there are so many of you telling me to just keep the cat. Just more proof the internet is filled with crazy people. This thing stank to high heaven and was not meant to be alive. I knew I had to get rid of it. I tried calling some adoption places last night, but none of them spoke English. There was a new faculty city tour coming up in the morning, so I figured I would ask someone there. I thought that one night with the weird howling creature would be manageable. It was utter torture. Back at the start of my career, I was working in Estonia, and I supervised a history class trip to Berlin. During our second night at the hotel, one of the kids tried climbing over the balconies to reach his classmate's window and fell. He just broke his leg, but it was a pretty long drop. The amount of worry and dread I went to sleep with that night in Berlin is just about the only thing comparable to last night. The inescapable stench, the terrible noises, the stare. I spent the whole night in utter dread. The creature spent the whole night shifting its gaze between me and the pigeons gathered out on the other side of the courtyard. Around four or five, I lost my nerve and tried pushing the cat out onto the roof. I figured if it was so interested in the pigeons, it could go investigate them on its own. The undead cat did not like that. The moment I touched it, the creature hissed and scratched and revealed teeth completely unlike those that Lola had. I had to do the three-hour city tour in the morning on no sleep whatsoever. What was considerably worse was that the smell of death had fused into my clothes and and people noticed. Prague is a fascinating city, but hearing about its history while sleep-deprived and smelling like an overfilled trash can is far from pleasant. No one from the school staff had any idea about pet adoption centers, but one of the folks who helped organize the tour told me she would send me some info on Monday, when the school year started. I wasn't about to start talking to a new colleague about undead cats. I made it sound like I was planning on adopting myself. Staying with the cat until Monday, though, was out of the question. I was going to go scour the expat-friendly section of the internet for a place to, to drop off the cat. But throughout the tour, the guide seemed to constantly find reasons to talk about how Prague is the most haunted city in Europe. When he took us for a beer after the tour, as a joke, I asked if he knew of any paranormal experts to consult with in Prague. Without missing a beat, the guide provided a business card of a woman who dealt with the occult and spoke English. She had an office at I.P. Pavlova and could help with whatever strange problems one might encounter around Prague. Being out in the fresh air helped me forget the horrid smell of the undead cat. Returning back to my apartment provided a terrible reminder. The sounds it made, the terrible way it stared at me. I knew that what was in the room with me was not my Lola, but the resemblance hurt. For a while, I did my best to ignore the strange cat and just search for adoption places. Yet, when my search didn't provide any results, I picked up my phone and called the number off the business card. The voice on the other side of the line was cold and slow. She said she didn't want to know what my problem was. That that is what the consolation was for. All the woman wanted to know was my name and when I would arrive. When she got that information out of me, she told me she looks forward to our meeting and hung up. I didn't know whether to take the cat with me. Picking it up made me dry heave and... 
Even if I could handle prolonged exposure to the horrible stench, the cat was not interested in being carried. As the clock counted down to my meeting with the presumed paranormal expert, however, I realized that going without the cat would make it considerably more difficult to explain my predicament. It hurt to put what used to be my Lola into the animal container, but I did my best to remind myself that the smelly, howling thing wasn't actually my cat. The paranormal expert's office was directly above a busy intersection. All the way up the stairs, I could hear the screeching of trams and constant hum of traffic. Yet, past the threshold of the office, all trace of the outside world disappeared. The windows were covered and the lights were off. Only a singular candle sitting on a table provided vision. The world outside had gone quiet, but the room was not completely silent. The howling from inside of the animal container refused to relent. She did not introduce herself, but she addressed me by name. She was in her thirties, maybe. That's all that I could figure out past the bizarre costume she wore. Her skin was colored a pale blue, and a mess of eyeballs were drawn on her forehead. The smell and meowing of the creature in my animal carrier was unavoidable, but she didn't mention it. She simply twitched her nose and asked me whether I was there for a tarot card session or a crystal ball reading. I told her I was there for neither. Holding back tears and rattling constant interruptions from the animal container, I told her the whole story. I told her everything. I told her everything from the little kitten that followed my trail of kebab meat back in university to how that little kitten grew to become an old globe-trotting cat to how that old cat died. Then I pointed at the animal container and told her that that's why I'm here. I told her I came to her because my cat had risen from the dead. With a nod that I could not decipher. The strange woman slunk back into the darkness of her office. She emerged with a glass sphere that looked like it belonged to the Ikea catalog. I tried to tell the woman that I wasn't looking for her to read my future, that I just wanted to figure out why my cat was still alive. She ignored me. She ignored me and started to rub the ball and dramatically chant in a language I couldn't understand. The louder the woman got, the more agitated the cat in the animal container got. It started to claw at the door and throw its body from side to side. The blue painted woman didn't spare as much as a look for the howling animal. She just ran her palms across the crystal ball and chanted and did a terrible pantomime of communing with the spirits or something among those lines. The glass sphere beneath her fingers was turning a sickly hue of green, but by then, I had decided that I was in the office of a fraud. The paranormal expert had zero interest in my problem and was just trying to squeeze money out of me. I had seen countless videos about the scams inside of Prague's tourist trade, and I had been dumb enough to take my tour guide at face value. I was beyond ready to leave and just... Consider my payment to the blue fortune teller an idiot tax. That's when the undead cat burst out of its container. Somehow, I don't know how, the cat managed to get the metal door of the box open. Immediately, it jumped onto the table and pressed both of its mangy paws against the crystal ball. Something popped inside of the glass sphere and the greenish light went dark. For a second, in the light of the candle, I could see the fortune teller's face twist from religious zeal to confusion. But then, the room was plunged into total darkness. A blood-red glow stemming from the crystal ball ate away at the darkness of the room. The cat, the corpse of my Lola, 
It was standing with its front paws pressed against the glass. Her familiar milky eyes were gone. Shining orbs of red had replaced them. No, no, no. This is not the vessel I was promised. The words seemed to be coming from some deep region of my skull, but, but on the crystal ball I could see a set of lips moving. They were bruised and chewed and, and wet with blood. No, 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 this is not the vessel I paid for. Whatever calm and cool demeanor that the mystic had disappeared the moment the candle went out. She was staring at me with her mouth wide open. The eyes that weren't drawn on were filled with terror. The covenant has not been fulfilled to my expectations. No, I demand reparations. The bloody lips screamed as the crystal ball grew brighter and brighter. A circle of salt. An unborn thing. Yes, that will free me of these shackles. A circle of salt. An unborn thing. I will avenge this swindle. A circle of salt. An unborn The crystal ball shattered in a flash of light. For a moment, as the room fell back into complete blackness, I could see the cat's eyes glow red in the dark like two fading embers. When even those went out, for a breath or two, the room plunged back into utter silence. I asked the fortune teller what to do. The blue lady shoved me out of the room, all trace of the mystic in her had disappeared. She was scared. She was scared and she wanted both me and the cat out of her office. She didn't even ask for money. She just shoved me outside of her door and closed it and locked it and refused any other form of communication. I was left alone with the corpse of my cat. Even before it had used a crystal ball to speak at me with bloody lips, I wanted to get rid of the thing. Whatever demonic stunt I had just witnessed pushed me over the edge. And I walked out of the building, crossed the intersection, and then went to the nearby KFC. A flock of pigeons was pecking away at discarded chips outside. I thought that was a good enough spot to leave the cat as any. She seemed interested in the pigeons in my courtyard, so I figured KFC pigeons would be just as interesting. They weren't. When I put down the animal container and opened the door, the cat had no interest in the pigeons. It simply sat there, howling and smelling like an aged corpse. It wasn't until I caught a tram that she crawled out of the box. And for a second, for a mere second, I could see Lola's eyes looking back at me. Then the doors closed and the tram screeched off. I'm not one for crying on public transport, but I did. I cried to a point where three separate people came to talk to me. Two of them came to check that I was okay. One of them came to tell me to keep it down. The good old charms of city life. I've cried on the tram ride back home, but I've got no more tears to give. I'm done now. I'm done with this whole insane situation, and I'm going to move on with my life and pretend as if nothing happened. I owed you guys an update, and now you have it. I'm never coming back to this weird corner of the internet. I'm, I'm never going to think about what happened to my poor Lola again. She died in a vet's office. She died in a vet's office a thousand miles away. And that's it. She died and she got buried and I've never heard of the name Marana Air.
The corporate offices in Marana Air are the furthest one can get from a professional environment. From the few employees that do show up, most arrive at work an hour late and spend most of their morning smoking and chatting in the parking lot. The break room is filled with half empty liquor bottles, the fridge smells like a morgue during a heat wave, and there's loose pills sitting in one of the kitchen cabinets. You never guessed that Marana Air had daily flights from just about every major airport in the Northern Hemisphere. No one in the office is a day over 30. Everyone seems generally confused about what their actual job is, and I wager a solid half of the employees are under the influence of oof, something. I have no idea how their service is on their flights, and I don't care to find out but the state of their offices definitely reflects in their tax documents. When I first arrived at Marana Air, the receptionist nearly had a panic attack. No one told her about the audit and she had no idea who to contact about it. With some convincing from my side, she let me set up a shop in an empty conference room that smelled of spilled beer. Then she left. When she returned nearly half an hour later, her eyes were pink with calmness. I was allowed to work out of the conference room, she said, but Everyone in charge of records was out sick for the week. I would have to find whatever paperwork I needed myself. Whatever words of protest I had fell on deaf, stoned ears. In all my years conducting audits, I had never witnessed a business this disorganized. My first day at Marana bore no fruit. After a search that took the better part of the afternoon, I found the CFO sleeping under her desk. She had braces and messy hair and no idea what her job description actually meant. Once I explained to her who I was and re-explained to her who she was, the CFO joined me in searching for the elusive financial documents. We made our way through the entire office building. The CFO moved with no urgency whatsoever and seemed wholly annoyed with my presence. Yes, there was a records room somewhere, she claimed. Problem was, she couldn't remember where. Nothing approaching financial records showed up on our search. Instead, we found a game of poker a bunch of employees drinking cooking rum, and a maintenance closet filled with rags that smelled overwhelmingly of sweat. Since the CFO couldn't remember what parts of the building we had searched, we found the maintenance closet twice. The CFO went home early that day. So did I. When I reported Marana Ayer's inability to assist with the terms of the audit, my boss told me he would run the complaint up the chain and get back to me. I wasn't excited about the prospect of going back to the offices, but I figured there was nothing left there to surprise me. I was wrong. Dead wrong. The CFO was beyond frustrated to see me in the lobby the next day. She told me that this was her first job out of uni and that she didn't really know what she was doing and oh, she'd really appreciate it if I just covered for her. When I reminded her I was an auditor and not her friend, the CFO rolled her eyes so hard, it looked as if she was going through a petite mal seizure. The CFO strolled through the offices and asked every employee we met if they knew where the financial records of the company were. When no answers were provided and the CFO grew tired of me following her, she started to take extended bathroom breaks. She'd excuse herself to go to the bathroom, hide in it for 20 minutes, and then look extremely disappointed when she found me standing outside waiting for her. I was on the third of these prolonged toilet breaks that I noticed the door. Financial reports read the sign next to it. I was sure it was the maintenance closet with the strange rags. The air outside of the door smelled gently of sweat and I had been familiarized with the closet twice before. Yet, as the minutes outside the bathroom dragged on, I found myself less confident. Out of duty and partially out of boredom, I opened the door. To my surprise, I was not greeted with a pile of filthy rags. Instead, in front of me sat a tight, dim hallway. For a couple of seconds, I searched the walls for a light switch, but then I realized that the fluorescents above me weren't off. They were still flickering, just very weakly. I chalked up the busted light bulbs to more ineptitude and let the door close behind me. The topography of the hallway seemed wholly nonsensical. The number of sharp turns I made through the jagged path seemed more reminiscent of a maze rather than an office. Something in the pit of my stomach was telling me that it would be wiser to turn back and retreat to where the light still worked. The prospect of spending more time with Marana Air's CFO, however, was irritating enough to keep me walking. I made my way through the winding hall until it opened up to reveal a room full of filing cabinets. Again, something at the base of my spine told me something was wrong with the room. Might have been the menagerie of dead plants sitting on top of the furniture or the office chairs randomly strewn across the room. 
weren't that the gray carpet was filthy with spills and mud and footsteps. It might have been any of those things, but the filing cabinets, their mere existence, well, that made me ignore my gut. The plastic labels on the filing cabinets were hard to read, but when I found one titled Q1 to Q315, I reached out and pulled the metal handle. The cabinet didn't budge. Instead, I found the tips of my fingers covered with a lukewarm, transparent slime. I tried to wipe it off the edge of the cabinet, but my hands only got stickier in the process. It's in that moment with the strange goop dripping from my hand that I decided to go back to the CFO. My discomfort about the room had manifested itself into action. It's in that moment, just as I was getting ready to flee the strange back room of the office, that I realized there was no escape. The hallway that had led me to the room was gone. It took less than a minute for the panic to set in. The room of filing cabinets was big, but not big enough to hide the hallway that I came in through. The only exits that led out of the room of filing cabinets led to the rooms with empty cubicles. With my clean hand, I reached for my phone. I wasn't sure if the stone receptionist would pick up my calls, but that quickly became irrelevant. There wasn't a single bar of signal on my phone. I kept composed. I had no idea where I was or how I would get back, but I kept composed. I, I, I did multiple circles around the room, looking for the tight hallway that had led me there. When that provided no results, I called out casually, <laughs> if anyone could hear me. I was doing my best to keep composed, but my will was starting to slip. I was desperate enough to scream just before I lost all composure, though I... I heard it. A flute. Barely noticeable beneath the flickering of the fluorescence, coming from one of the office rooms beyond. I heard a quiet flute. The song it played lacked all melody or rhythm, and once again, I found goosebumps springing down my back, but with nowhere else to go, I followed the flute. The faint music led me from one room of cubicles to another. With each doorway that I passed, the workspace got more and more disorganized. Where once the cubicles sat in orderly rows, they were now scattered across with no rhyme or reason. The air had turned humid and hot and sweat started to crawl down my back. I was as careful as one can be when I took off my jacket, but still managed to dirty it with the strange goop that was on my hand. I was sweaty and scared, and the office around me was starting to look like it had been hit by a tornado, but I kept on following the toneless music in front of me. When I finally saw the flute player, my stomach urged me to stop once more. This time I listened to it. The cubicles were all pushed to the edges of the room, giving the man with the flute ample space for his performance. His face was wrinkled with effort and his hair was messy and gray. The man was a janitor, or at least he wore a uniform that would suggest that job. When I first saw him, I must cried out for attention, but that eerie feeling of something being wrong gave me pause. In that pause, I saw the flute player's audience. Immediately, I ducked behind one of the turned over cubicles. A fresh crop of sweat flushed through my body. For a moment, my rushing heartbeat overpowered the sound of the flute, but the instrument quickly grew in its volume. I tried to convince myself that I was just seeing things, that I had done nothing but stumbled upon a man poorly playing the flute in the back room of an office. <laughs> one peek from behind the cubicle dispelled all of my doubts. What I was seeing was far from normal. What I was seeing was beyond the scope of comprehension. The janitor was playing his strange flute song to an inhuman audience. At first glance, they were simply filthy rags thrown across the floor. But with each note of the monotone music, the crusty pieces of cloth moved. Like tiny dancers, they spun and hopped in union with the rhymeless tune. My mind was already on edge from my strange environs, but the sight of the dancing filth sent me over the edge, clenched my fists, and stifled a scream. At first I managed to smother the shriek, yet one look at my hand forced the terrified groan out of my throat, where the goop had once been translucent and now filled up with specks of grime just as the change in the slime hit me, so did the smell. It smelled of aged sweat, just like the rags in the maintenance closet. My hand was starting to tingle with each note that the shrill flute, the grime on my hand pushed with unexplainable energy. As the rhythm of the janitor's music sped up, so did the grip of the sludge on my hand. 
With each note, it squeezed harder and harder until just before its grip became painful, the ooze of filth jumped from my hand to the shaggy carpet of the office. Like a being with a mind of its own, it crawled through the gray carpet, leaving behind a trail of grime. When the maddening dark blob pulled itself past my hiding spot, I felt the gentlest breath of relief. With my body tucked away behind the cubicle and the strange slime off my skin, I could at least pretend that my circumstances were slightly less maddening. For a moment, I felt the slightest pang of relief. It only lasted a couple of notes. Without warning, the strange music of the flute came to an end. All that could be heard was the flickering of the spotty fluorescent lights and the sound of wet rags shifting. Hello? Is anyone there? Yelled the janitor. His voice was gruff and held no trace of friendliness. Come out immediately. You don't belong here. A part of me wanted to cry out to him. A part of me wanted to hold on to the idea that the janitor was someone who could get me out of those strange back rooms. I wanted to have hope that he would lead me back out to the hallway so I could escape the Marana Air offices once and for all, but... But deep inside, I knew the man meant me harm. Quickly, the janitor's composure broke. He started to scream with a furious and vulgar zeal. He threatened to murder me unless I show myself at once. His threats barely connected into words. The pure rage in his voice stole away all meaning and turned into human barks. As terrifying as his threats were, the janitor's constant screams gave me clear indication of where he was. He was searching the other side of the room. I decided my only chance of escape was to sneak out whilst the murderous man was searching elsewhere. The moment I tried to move my feet, however, I found myself stuck. My heels were fused to the floor. The shaggy gray carpet had intertwined with my shoes and made any movement with them impossible. The janitor's shouts were getting closer. With no time to spare, I ripped my feet out of my shoes and crept away from the violent threats. I managed to follow the wall to an exit from the room, but I could still hear the janitor's nonsensical fury. The positioning of the cubicles in the next room was like that of a maze, but I did not concern myself with the details of my environs. I simply moved as quickly and silently between the plastic walls in hopes of not being murdered. I was well inside of the maze of cubicles when he found my shoes. It seemed like the janitor's fury was at its zenith, but when he found concrete evidence of my existence, he screamed even louder. He said that when he would find me, he would crush my skull. He screamed that I had ventured into a place that no one was to know about. I moved even faster. When I was sure he wasn't behind me, I started to run. Adrenaline was surging through my body, and I was already drenched in fearful sweat. But the further along the maze of plastic I ran, the more it became clear that the floor was wet as well. The deeper I ventured into the back rooms, the louder the squishes of my footsteps became. I paid no mind to the nature of the floor or the rhythm of my heart. My focus was wholly on getting as far away from the mad janitor as I could. His threats were terrifying, yet the more I ran fainter they became. When the janitor's cries were no longer audible, I breathed a sigh of relief. <sighs> when the plastic walls of the cubicle parted to reveal a familiar, tight hallway, the sigh turned into a cry of happiness. The carpet had turned into a puddle of God knows what. My chest ached with exhaustion, and I was drenched in sweat. But the tight hallway seemed familiar enough to give me hope. After a couple turns of the corridor, however, my heart dropped once more. I heard the shrill notes of the flute again. They weren't coming from a specific part of the office. The terrible rhythmless music permeated from the walls themselves. I continued walking, trying to ignore those terrible notes that danced around me. The music, however, was not the only thing that scared me. At first, I, I thought it was just the trick of the eye. Uh, I thought that maybe through the sheer exhaustion of my ordeal, I was seeing things, but after a couple of the strained notes, I knew I could lie to myself no longer. The ceiling of the office was dropping lower and lower with each note. The hallway was closing in on me. I hoped that each turn through the jagged path would be the last, but the corridor shrunk before me without an exit. It wasn't just the ceilings of the hallway that were changing. With each corner I rounded, the floor grew wetter and wetter. The carpet was no longer gray. A thick layer of Grimy water rendered it jet black. As the ceilings grew too low for me to sprint, I started to feel something tugging at my feet from beneath the black water. When the ceiling grew low enough for me to crawl, I was certain of it. 
Each note of the shrill flute was accompanied by a tightening of the carpet. It was as if the hallway itself was trying to trap me. With each note of the shrill flute, the grip from beneath the lukewarm water grew tenser and tenser. I heard the janitor again. He screamed vulgar threats between each of the notes. He described in detail how he would break my bones and rip out my tongue if I was to ever tell anyone what I had witnessed in the hallway. He threatened to brutalize my body if I ever escaped, so I crawled through the dark sludge as fast as I could. There was scarcely room for me to crawl when I finally saw the end of the hallway. There was no door. Instead, there was a mess of cloth gathered at the end of the corridor. The cloth moved much like the janitor's eldritch audience. From beneath the water, I could feel tendrils of something cold and malicious reaching beneath my fingers. The air reeked with ancient sweat and my mouth tasted of battery acid. The sight of the squirming wall of rags made my stomach turn, but I knew that the janitor would not spare me if he caught up with me. Gathering every ounce of courage I had in my drained body, I launched into the wall of filthy cloth. The smell was overpowering and the rags reached out from my body like malicious tentacles. As I crawled through the shifting mess of filth, the flute and threats grew more distant. I crawled and prayed and held my breath until I could crawl no more. My skull hit something solid. Before panic could wholly consume me, I realized I could not stand up. It took me a mere second to find the door of the maintenance closet. I found myself standing in the familiar well-lit offices of Marana Air. I did not stay long. Shoeless and covered in grime, I sprinted out of the building, got in my car, and promised to never return again. I have been reassigned from the audit but I doubt my boss believed a word of what happened to me. He kept on saying he would send someone else to do the job, that Marana Air would be forced to cooperate with the audit, and eventually. I don't know what fate awaits whoever comes in next week instead, and honestly, I won't allow myself to worry about that. I'm just happy. I'm just happy I escaped the back rooms of Marana Air. Susan, I want this email to remain between the two of us. I know you like to gossip, and I saw that anti-work post you made about Charlie. But please, Susan, don't tell anyone about this email. I don't know who else to go to. You're the only person whose private contact I have, and if I went to HR, I would get fired. Or worse. Susan, I saw something tonight. I stayed at the office after everyone had left, and I saw something I was not meant to see. I saw something... Something incomprehensible and mad, and I am in danger. You're the only one I can turn to. You're the only one I can trust. Susan, the janitor threatened to murder me today. He, he threatened to murder me, and it is only another promise that I wouldn't tell a soul that he'd let me go. He let me go, but I can't stay silent. Look, look, we both know no work is ever done at the office. People just clock into Marana to drink and smoke and look busy. I've heard someone say that it's just because we're a regional office that's used for tax breaks. We're not. I checked. We're the corporate headquarters of an airline that has daily flights in every major city in the world. Look, Susan, have you ever seen someone call a customer? Have you, in the past six months, seen anyone do any work at Marana? No, you haven't. That's because we're not doing any of the work. We're just cover. We're just cover for what happens in the offices during the night. We're just, we're just tiny pawns in something bizarre and dangerous. And today, I saw things as they are. If anyone else at Marana finds out that I saw what I saw, I'm as good as dead. So please, Susan, please, Susan, I beg you. Don't post any of this to Reddit. So, so some guy from sales has a birthday party, right? 
We're celebrating at the top floor, then celebrate a bit more at the bar across the street. By the time we get back to the office, I'm really hammered. Heard that serious looking audit lady is back, so I hide under my desk to keep out of sight. I figured I'll sleep it off and then wake up around five, go get something to eat and then go home. I didn't. I woke up in pitch darkness, curled up beneath my desk. I was still pretty hammered, but the moment I came to, I knew where I was. I could also smell a familiar stench. You know that supply closet full of rags on the second floor? The one that everyone complains about because it smells like ancient sweat? That smell. I could smell that stench inside my cubicle. There was a pile of rags sitting on my chair. It was only thanks to the few rays of light from the street lamps outside that I could see the thing. But I was certain. Sitting behind my desk, shaped like a man, sat a pile of those sweat-stained rags from the supply closet. They were typing. It was typing. The, the, the smell, the shock, the amount of tequila I drank for lunch, it all caught up with me. I, I needed to vomit. I needed to vomit, but I was so scared that the thing, that, that, that creature that was sitting behind my desk typing away at my computer, I, I feared it was sentient beyond office work. I, I feared it would do something to me. The air smelled like barf in a hot car, Susan. But I stayed put beneath my desk. I stayed put and prayed for the world to return to normal or, or, or for me to wake up in my bed with the whole smelly rag affair just being a, a byproduct of my drunkenness. My prayers weren't answered. For what felt like an hour, I stayed curled up beneath my desk, holding down nausea and trying to control my breath. I, I feared that I would be stuck in my delirious predicament for the whole night. But then I heard the shrill notes of a flute. Walking between the cubicles with no rhythm and no set melody, someone was playing the flute. The moment the first notes of that cryptic song could be heard, the mess of rags that was typing at my desk stood up. With wet, squelching footsteps, the being walked off into the hall. Seizing my chance of escape, I crawled out from beneath my desk and took a peek out of my cubicle. The mess of rags was not alone. It was joined by other clumps of filth and sweat that shoveled their way to the center of the office, walking among the cubicles, leading the procession of rag creatures, was... Susan, I know this all sounds like a joke. I know what I'm describing is wholly insane, but I swear I am not making this up. I swear this is true. It was the janitor. The janitor was leading the procession of rag creatures. The same janitor that hangs around the parking lots in the morning. The same one that gets really aggressive if you complain about the mess in the supply closet. That guy who's a head taller than everyone else at the office and looks like he's just left a war zone that same janitor was leading the march of the rack creatures with a flute he played the flute off key and out of rhythm but the creatures following the grizzled man were dancing or at least bobbing to the shrill sounds of his instrument he was walking up and down the office in slow measured steps and seemed to be completely focused on his music. As drunk and nauseous and terrified as I was, I saw my chance at escape. When the flute playing janitor had his back turned to me, I rushed towards the staircase out of the building. I almost made it. I almost made it to the staircase and out of that cursed office. Yet rising to my feet was far too much for my drained body. Just before I reached the door to the stairs, I lost my balance and, and fell. I managed to hide behind one of the cubicles, but my landing had stopped the janitor's playing. Immediately, a flashlight was aimed in my direction. At first, the janitor called out into the darkness with some semblance of sanity. He asked me to come out of my hiding spot. 
He told me that no one was allowed in the offices after sundown. At first, his tone was reasonably civilized, but when I didn't show, when I didn't listen to his orders, the janitor lost his mind. His steady voice gave way to a flurry of violent vulgarity. The janitor screamed about how he would crush my skull if I didn't show, how he would cut up my body until I couldn't be recognized. I was nauseous and drunk and drained, but hearing the sheer madness of the voice approaching me, I knew I had to run. I leaped out of my hiding place and sprinted down the stairwell. I'd managed to make my way down the first staircase without stumbling, but by the time I reached the second set of stairs, my legs gave out. I fell down the stairs, and before I knew it, the janitor was on top of me. He lifted me up by my shirt and slammed me against the wall. For a moment, I was relieved that he had none of those terrible rag creatures in tow. My relief was misplaced. The janitor came down the staircase without the filthy demons, but he did have a knife. A big, dull combat knife that he pressed against my throat. His hands were shaking and his voice was manic. The janitor was clearly panicked, but I had no doubt he would end my life there and then. He, he screamed. He screamed about gutting me like a fish, about making sure that no one ever finds out what I saw. He raved and rambled about how my life was going to end because I had witnessed too much. The madness in his eyes, the blade, his fury, it was far too much for me to handle. I was so scared, I puked. I puked on the janitor in fear, and I'm certain that's the only reason why I'm able to write this email right now. The vomit tempered him. He dropped me and continued to scream at me. His anger, however, seemed to be more focused on me dirtying his uniform, rather than me interrupting whatever horrid ritual I had stumbled into. Seizing my chance, I begged. I begged for my life, and I promised him I saw nothing, and I swore on everything that is holy that I would never tell a living soul what I have seen. At first he wasn't convinced, but with enough tears, enough begging, and some dry heaves, he let me go. When he let me go, I thought that I would actually stay true to my word. I thought I would get home and pass out and forget about the whole affair, but the longer I think about it, the more I consider what I saw. Look, Susan, this all seems insane. I know. I know getting in this email in the middle of the night must seem like some unfunny prank, but I swear what I saw is real. The office we work in is, is a front for something horrid. Whatever work is done in the Morana offices during the night is a part of something terrible and inhuman. I don't know how I'll go into the office tomorrow. I don't know how. I'll be able to pass by that supply closet and pretend it's not connected to some, some terrible ritual. I don't know how I'll carry on. Please, Susan, please, please tell me I'm not insane. It caught my eye the moment I got behind the desk. The pamphlet was lightly wedged between a potted plant and a filing cabinet, no doubt having slipped someone's hand and mind as papers were being shuffled around the nursing home. The pamphlet must have been casually dropped recently, yet it looked ancient. Its paper was yellowing and worn, and the pages were ever so gently sticking together. Even its font, regal and as far from modern as one might go, seemed to come from a different time. Fly with Marana Air to places you have seen but forgotten. Most of the adverts that would make their way through the nursing home would have large lettering to complement our clientele's eyesight. The titles of the Marana Air flyer were just as big as any other, yet... The actual text of the ad was so minuscule, even my healthy eyes couldn't read it. Float. The first page commanded. Beneath the title, there was a scrawl of ant-sized literature, 
and beneath the text there was a picture of an old bearded man. He was inside of a dark empty airplane and had a look of utter shock stamped on his face. He was floating. Go far away. The next page ordered, accompanied with a photograph of a massive black airplane flying over a majestic cover of clouds. The photograph was composed like any other airline advert, but there was something wrong with that plane. Its wings were far too short to accommodate its long raised hull. The plane didn't look like it should be capable of flight. Touch loved ones. The third page read, Beneath the title sat an image I could not decipher. I do not know whether it was a photograph or a drawing or some sort of collage. The image was dark and within that darkness there were hands and wild faces caught in the midst of some religious rapture. There were no images on the back of the flyer. The space had been completely taken up by Marana Air's supposed motto. Never weep alone, fly Marana Air. I was new in the nursing home. It was my first shift without supervision. The flyer seemed odd, sure, but there were plenty of other odd things in the Wolf Pines assisted living facility for me to contend with. When I found the flyer, I simply tucked it away into one of the filing cabinets and pushed its queer offers far from my mind. The holiday season was busy. Families would come to visit their relatives and the residents themselves would travel out of the facility to celebrate their Christmases. The paperwork associated with the visits, along with the occasional lonely resident who tried sneaking out with the crowds, kept me occupied. Yet, a couple of days after the new year, I find myself thinking about Marana Air once more. It was a stormy January night. I had done a couple of night shifts before and learned to enjoy the calmness that they provided. By the time I clocked in, visitation hours were long over and no one ever called the nursing home past sundown. I grabbed myself a book and prepared to enjoy an evening of rainy solitude. It didn't occur to me for a while and it certainly didn't occur to me then but that night was the first Friday of the month. A couple of minutes before midnight, an orderly came in with a resident. Apparently, Mr. So-and-so had a taxi picking him up to take him to the airport. When I asked the resident where he was flying to, he stared back on in silence. When I asked the orderly, he simply shrugged. No matter how hard I tried, the old man was impenetrable to my attempts at conversation. He would occasionally grunt to show that he had heard my questions, but he wouldn't return a single word or look me directly in the eye. When I finally gave up and returned to my book, I found myself rereading the same paragraph over and over unable to concentrate on the text. That's when the thought hit me. Morana Air! I reached into the cabinet and found the flyer exactly where I had left it a couple of weeks prior. I grabbed it and took it to the resident close enough that he could read the massive lettering on the front. The moment I showed the old man the flyer, his cloudy eyes grew wide with shock with a quickness I did not think he was capable of, he snatched the flyer from my hands and shoved it into his coat. The old man's sudden burst of shock produced even more questions from me. Amongst other things, I wanted to know why he snatched the flyer away from me. With the first barrage of questions, the old man still wouldn't meet my eyes. 
Yet, when it became clear I wasn't going to leave without answers, he finally looked up. <sighs> they don't like it when you ask questions, he said, in a voice balancing between a whisper and a wheeze. Then, he shifted his eyes to the floor from which they did not rise. The old man's words troubled me. After a couple more futile attempts at talking to him, I made my way back to the desk and called to make sure he was indeed meant to get on some midnight taxi. The orderly who had brought him picked up the phone and assured me that Mr. So-and-so's paperwork was all in order and that his caretakers and family had signed off on the trip. If I wanted more information, the orderly said, I should get it out of the old man myself. The phone call couldn't have taken more than a minute or two, but it was, to put it lightly, frustrating. The orderly had zero interest in the resident's mental state and wasn't the least bit concerned with the old man's strange behaviour. Seeing that sort of attitude from someone who was meant to take care of vulnerable people made me angry and through that anger, I lost focus. Again, it couldn't have been more than a minute or two and I doubt I was distracted enough to not notice the squeaky sliding door open or close but when the orderly finally hung up on me, I found the old man gone. The storm outside had picked up to a tropical degree but in my panic, I ran out into the frigid rain. Off by the gates of the nursing home, I could see tail lights turning off onto the main road. The man had caught his taxi. His destination was a complete mystery to me, and the idea of dropping off a senile man at the airport filled me with disgust. But both his caretakers and his family had signed off on the trip. I tried to content myself with the idea that I was simply doing my job and I returned to my book. I tried hard to focus, but I kept reading the same three pages over and over again. The Wolf Pines Assisted Living Facility had a staff room, but it was sparsely populated. People were always working, and, when they had breaks, they would either smoke in front of the gates, or, if they had a car, ride back home for lunch. From the few colleagues that I did find a moment to chat with, none were interested in my questions about Marana Air, or the strange midnight taxi ride. Apparently, Marana was a charity that offered free senior trips to residents. That's all my colleagues knew and cared to know. The food served at the Wolf Pines cafeteria is better suited for the palate of people half a century older than me, but the tables face a beautiful garden. Whenever I was working day shifts, I'd pack a lunch and eat in the cafeteria. My breaks were pretty late, so the tables were mostly empty. Every once in a while, though, some of the residents would join me and chat. They were considerably nicer than the employees, and I really started to look forward to my lunch breaks. When I asked the residents about Marana Air, however, they had no answers. A lady of about 90 said that one of her friends went on a Marana air trip a couple weeks back. When I tried to find out where the trip went, or whether her friend had talked about it, her memory was far too faded. She didn't recall if her friend ever spoke of the trip. She couldn't recall whether her friend had returned at all. I had so many questions about Marana air. Yet as the weeks dragged on, they lost their urgency. I had worked plenty of night shifts since that January storm, 
yet nothing of interest happened. No one entered the building, no one left, and the phone only rang once, and that was purely because someone misdialed the last digit of a pizza parlour. It was only three months later, at the start of April, that the spectre of Marana Eyre entered my life again. Just at around midnight, a familiar orderly entered the lobby. He was accompanying a frail old man with a thinning beard. Rolling next to the resident was an oxygen tank. When I told the orderly that the airport might have an issue with the oxygen tank, he simply shrugged. Mr. So-and-so had a taxi coming for him to take him to the airport. His caretakers and his family had approved of the trip. It wasn't the orderly's job, or my job for that matter, to poke around the details. I tried to talk to the old man, but it was of no use. No matter how sweet, or curious, or direct I was, the man wouldn't answer my questions or meet my eye. When I had finally given up and sat back down at my desk, I could hear the faintest whisper from him. They don't like it when you ask questions, the old man said, and then took a drag from his oxygen mask. There wasn't a thunderstorm outside this time, so when the taxi arrived, I could see it from my desk. Immediately, I got up and offered to help the resident to the car, but the old man shooed me off and Ned said something about them not liking it when anyone helps. The man shambled away to the taxi, pulled his oxygen tank in, and then the car drove off into the darkness. The return of the strange airport fare was a reminder of the Morana Air mystery, but it made me no wiser on the subject. I sat behind that desk all night long, trying to make sense of what I had seen. By the time the sun rose, I was no wiser on where Marana Air was taking the residents of Wolf Pines, but I had noticed a pattern. Twice they had come on the first Friday of the month. I wasn't scheduled for the May 5th night shift, but I made some uneven trades with the smokers outside the gates. When the first Friday of the month came again, I was back behind that desk. My book stayed shut the whole night. The orderly wasn't of much help, but I didn't expect him to be. The woman, likewise, wasn't helpful in illuminating the mystery of Morana Air. When I started asking questions about where the taxi was going, she averted her eyes and focused on fidgeting with her ring. I had some hope for getting information out of the travelling resident, but that was not the crux of my plan. I was going to talk to the taxi driver. I was going to find out what happened with our residents when they reached the airport. Outside, the night was calm and still. As if the driver knew I was waiting, the taxi didn't come for a long time. When I registered the faintest bit of light in the driveway, however, I was on my feet and ready to ask questions. When I approached the door, the old lady blocked my path. She, much like the other midnight riders, said that they did not like folks asking questions or going with company. When I demanded the old lady explain who they were, she did not provide any answers. Instead, she slipped off her ring and offered it to me as payment. I wasn't someone to be bribed. I was looking out for her. All I wanted to do was talk to the taxi driver to make sure the old woman would be safe. She offered the ring to me in scared whispers, yet when I declined her bribe, the old woman's demeanour completely changed. She turned aggressive 
With shouts and swipes of her nails, she demanded I let her through the front door to her taxi. The woman was frail, and she posed no danger to me, yet her shouts had alerted a trio of orderlies who entered the lobby to investigate. Her family and caretakers had signed off on the trip, they said. I was in no position to stop her, or interview the taxi driver, they said. By the time I got home, I received a mass email from Wolf Pines management. The email did not name me directly, but it concerned the practice of exchanging shifts without notifying management. Exchanging shifts, according to the email, was strictly forbidden and bordered on fraud. Anyone found partaking in this swindling of the company would be punished. By the time I woke up, I had a second email waiting for me in my inbox. The email, once again, came from Wolf Pines Management, but this time, I was its only recipient. I was not just chastised for manipulating one of my co-workers into exchanging shifts, but also for getting into a yelling match with one of the residents and disparaging a charity that worked with the nursing home. Apparently, Marana Eyre graciously offered residents of Wolf Pines free trips to exotic destinations. That was all I needed to know. Any further questions weren't welcome. When I made my way to the afternoon shift, my spirits were low. Getting chewed out in the two emails didn't feel good. But most importantly, I didn't manage to confront the taxi driver and my chances at being able to do so again seemed nil. Not long after I settled at my desk though, a familiar cab pulled into the driveway. The taxi driver was a big, burly guy, but he spoke in a near whisper. Nervously, he asked me if I knew anything about the residents that leave the nursing home every first Friday of the month. I was beyond relieved to be talking to the man, but my response seemed to have scared him. When I asked where the customers went and whether they spoke about their journey in the car, he simply shook his head. He said he just dropped them off at the airport, as he was instructed to do by dispatch. That was all he knew. Nothing weird happened on the rides. I tried asking more questions, but the driver had suddenly become uninterested in talking to me. By the time I even said the words Marana Air, he was already out the door. For a brief moment, I thought I could find answers, but then I was plunged back into darkness. The taxi driver's reaction made me certain that there was something off about the midnight trips. The moment he saw that I also had questions about all the strange airport rides, he backed out. He had questions too, but he knew a lot more than he was letting on. Halfway through my shift, I got another visit. My boss dropped by my desk to repeat the fine points of the two emails I had received from management. Her tone was a lot nicer than the text, but within her friendly attitude and empathetic voice, there was a clear message. I wasn't meant to ask more questions about Marana Air. They were a trusted partner of Wolf Pines, and implying that their trips were somehow unsafe was not appropriate under any circumstances. If I was to keep my job, I was to stop asking questions. Without much of a choice, I told my boss that my curiosity about Marana Air had been satisfied. I knew that I could no longer ask any of my co-workers, but for a couple of days, I kept some hope alive for the taxi driver coming back. From the look on his face, I could tell that he knew that something was wrong with the midnight trips. From the look on his face... I could tell that he felt guilty. Yet, 
the taxi driver never came back. As the weeks went on, Marana Eyre went from being a mystery that consumed every waking moment of my internal monologue to an eerie curiosity that I would occasionally think about shortly before I fell asleep. I still didn't know where the elderly residents of Wolf Pines were taken every first Friday of the month, but what I did know was that I couldn't lose my job. After the initial mystery of the midnight trips, my life in Wolf Pines attained a calming regularity. There was the occasional escape attempt for me to calmly prevent, and every other week I'd get at least one mind-boggling phone call from an overbearing relative, but aside from that, work was just as tranquil as it could be. I managed to make a big dent in my reading list with the night shifts, and on the busier day shifts, I always had my lunch breaks to look forward to. Many of the friendships I had made in the cafeteria were tragically short, but such is the nature of friendships in nursing homes. Throughout the months, I had said goodbye to a lot of the old folks who would sit with me during lunch, but one stayed a constant. Gabriella. Gabriella was a stout woman in her early 90s. Aside from the wrinkles on her face and the difficulty she had sitting down or getting up from her chair, you couldn't tell though. Gabriella's mind was sharper than most healthy adults I know, and her sense of humour had the cut of a professional. She had spent most of her life teaching and had an endless supply of stories from all the corners of the country where she had taught. Whenever I went for lunch, she'd be sitting by my usual spot waiting for me. My chat with Gabriella quickly became the highlight of my workday. I had mentioned Morana Eyre to her once. The cafeteria workers seemed completely uninterested in anything past the lunch queue and there were no other members of staff in the room, yet I still found myself speaking about Marana in a whisper. I was actually relieved when Gabriella said she had never heard of them. By then, the questions of the midnight rides were starting to slip from my mind. Gabriella not being familiar with Marana Eyre calmed me. I presume there still was a taxi arriving at Wolf Pines every first Friday of the month to pick up our residents, yet, without being involved myself, the concept was abstract enough to forget about. I had accepted that some mysteries were better left unexplored. I almost forgot about Marana Eyre altogether, but last week I was given a horrid reminder. It was a day like any other. I got off from my lunch break around three and Gabriella was already sitting at our usual table, waiting for me with her tray of easily chewable food. Something about her was different though. That usual sharpness of mind that reflected in her eyes had dawned, or more accurately, was flickering away. When I sat down, she spoke no differently than she usually did, but every couple of sentences, her eyes would glaze over and her articulation descended into the realm of a child. At first, I simply thought that something was wrong with her in a medical sense. It was tragic, yes, but the woman was not far from being a century old I thought I was simply watching someone's years catch up with them. But then, about halfway through my sandwich, Gabriella took out a familiar piece of paper. Fly with Marana Air to places you have seen but forgotten. She said a handsome young man in a suit had come to her room last night and told her all about Marana Air. She would go on a trip far, far away and meet everyone she had missed for so long. She would fly high up in the sky, and float, and laugh, and feel young once more. She would fly with Marana Air, and best of all, 
the trip was completely free. When she spoke about the trip, her voice lost all trace of the Gabriella I knew. Even though she was 90, when Gabriella spoke about Morana Eyre, she took on the voice and look of a barely cognizant child. I tried asking questions. I tried asking about who the handsome young man was, or where she was flying to, or why she would trust a mysterious travel company that she had never heard about before. To my questions, Gabriella simply shook her head. They don't like it when you ask questions, she said. I had heard those words enough to not have any faith in getting past them. Instead of asking more questions, I asked Gabriella if I could borrow the pamphlet and give it back to her the following day. For a moment, her eyes attained the same sharpness I was accustomed to. She gave me the pamphlet and then, with complete lucidity, asked me how my day was going. I told her I had a meeting with the boss coming up and had to cut our lunch short. Gabriella said she was looking forward to seeing me the next day. I never saw her again. I didn't lie about the meeting. My boss wasn't expecting me, but I did meet her. Pamphlet in hand, and with 15 minutes left on my lunch break, I went to her office and repeated my qualms about Morana Eyre. She was surprised to see me unearth the forbidden topics months after I was told to drop it, but when I showed her the pamphlet, when I told her about the handsome young man that came into rooms of one of the residents last night, my superior's demeanour changed. Holding the pamphlet by the tips of her fingers as if it was covered with filth, she started to ask questions. For the first time since I started working at Wolf Pines, I saw my boss become visibly concerned. She spoke slowly, calculating each word. She wanted me to tell her, in detail, about all of the midnight shifts I had worked there where residents left for Marana Air flights. She asked me about the taxi driver and the woman who tried to give me the ring, and then... When I had answered all of her questions, and posed some of my own, she fired me. My termination had nothing to do with Marana Air. I had left the reception desk unattended for over 10 minutes. That was unacceptable. When I tried to argue the decision, she summoned a familiar orderly that showed me the door. I've checked before. I've checked many, many times before, but there's still no trace of Marana Air online. They have no website, they have no way to book flights, and there isn't a trace of evidence of them ever having any charity programs for senior citizens. I've been warned that if I try to go to Wolf Pines Assisted Living Facility under any circumstances, the authorities would be contacted and charges would be pressed. The last thing I want to do is end up in cuffs, but as I watch the days count down to the start of the month, I can't help but to wonder what will happen to Gabriella. I can't help but wonder where the midnight taxi will take her. First time I got the call was a year back. It was a miserable January night and the sky couldn't decide whether we were in a rainstorm or a snowstorm. The roads were slick, the wind howled and most importantly, no one was out drinking. I was gonna muster up a cough and tell dispatch I needed to clock out early. But before I could gather up the theatrical spirit, a ride request came in. Wolf Pines assisted living facility to the airport good long fare for out of city rates first come first serve I wasn't the only one who wanted to call it an early night no one volunteered I would have kept quiet myself 
if it weren't for the second plea. The ride had been ordered three weeks in advance, but the dispatch girl forgot to put it into the system. She begged for someone to take the ride. She didn't want to get fired. I guess back then, I was a bit sweet on her. Even past the fizzle of the speaker, I could hear the despair in her voice. Couldn't have that. Volunteered just to put her at ease. Plus, airport fares always tipped. Figured I could make a quick buck before turning in for the night, and a quick buck I did make. It's not the money that bothers me. It's how I made it. So, I arrive at the nursing home. It's pouring down something fierce and I can barely see past my windshield. Fair's nowhere to be seen. So sit and wait and pray that I'm not getting someone with heavy bags or a wheelchair or any other combination of things that would make me get out of the car. Then I think how my grandma used to complain young folk never help and feel the slightest tinge of guilt. I almost get out of the car to see whether my fare isn't waiting in the lobby for me, but before my guilt drives me into the rain, the back door of my car opens. The man who gets in seems to have at least a century under his belt and smells so much like an hospital I have to roll down the windows. No luggage though, just a soaked hat that he places in his lap the moment he enters. I check the destination with him, give him a ballpark sum and then set off. He doesn't make small talk, and I don't pry. I've driven for long enough not to ask people's business. The old timer doesn't talk, but he breathes funny. There's a whistling in his throat that makes me wonder about how many smokes he used to take down when he was my age. To drown out that thought and my perverse need for a cigarette, I flip on the oldies station and play the man music he might have listened to in the tail end of his middle age. The radio, however, does not stay on for long. About 15 minutes off from the airport, the radio, along with the rain, fizzles out. I didn't think anything odd back then, as I said it was a miserable night. Maybe I noticed the darkness outside growing thicker. Maybe I did find it odd that the world slowly descended into nothing but the dim reflectors on the edges of the road. Maybe I did notice on that first ride, but I made nothing of it. It wasn't until the old man suddenly grabbed me that I thought something was amiss. It wasn't a rough grab. The old timer's bony hands were in no shape to do me actual harm, but it did spook me, and I hate being spooked when I'm behind the wheel. Before the anger could reach my chest though, it was replaced with confusion. The old man told me he wanted to get out of the car. He wanted to get out of the car, right there and then, in the middle of a dark road miles away from the airport. The old timer's expression was wholly blank, but his words were clear and there was money in his hand. Money that happened to be triple the original fare estimate. He wanted me to take all of it. I put up a token of resistance, but I didn't argue with the man for long. I took his money, wished him a pleasant night, and watched him disappear off into the thick veil of black beyond the road markers. I was confused. I was confused, but I've also been driving strangers for 15 years. If an ancient man stumbling off into the darkness was going to be the weirdest part of this story, I would have already forgotten about it. One month later, on an unseasonably warm February night, I got the exact same fare. Wolf Pines Assisted Living Facility to the airport. Booked ahead of time, but once again, lost to the mystery of our reservation system. This time around, the passenger was an ancient woman who had the voice and stench of a lifelong smoker. Once she confirmed her destination with a froggy, yes, she stayed completely silent until we reached that dark patch of road. Just like the old man, she wanted out and was willing to pay triple for the doors to be opened. I didn't tell dispatch. I'm trying to make sense of the rides would make me sound insane, and more importantly, the extra money helped me cover some outstanding debts I had with some unkind characters. The prospect of sharing the money, or worse, having someone else take the fares, didn't sit well with me. I didn't tell dispatch the first month, or the second month, 
or the third month when the pattern became crystal clear. Every first Friday of the month, and around midnight, I'd be driving an old person into pitch darkness and getting paid a surgeon's salary to do it. It was all strange, I'd admit that even back then, but people are strange, and in my line of work, I meet a lot of them. I kept mum, and kept the money, and did my best not to analyse the details too much. When the first Friday of April rolled around, however, I found myself significantly more curious about my elderly customer's destination. She was old, just like the rest of them, but there was more sort of a regal air about her. She had her hair all done up, smelled like a pricey perfume joint, and even though no amount of makeup could smooth the years off her skin, she was all dolled up like she was ready for the opera. When I asked if she was going to the airport, she simply nodded. She seemed unsure of her destination. The whole ride through, she kept on fidgeting with her hands. When the darkness outside thickened, and the radio buzzed out, she started to fidget harder. As that familiar patch of road came up, she didn't grab me or shout like the others did. She simply tapped me on the shoulder. Familiarised with the way these rides usually went, I slowed the car to a stop. She didn't get out. She didn't say a word, or ready her money or anything else the old folks usually did. She just sat there, silent, fidgeting with her hands. It's then that I noticed the ring. It sat on her frail finger like the golden arches on a dead stretch of highway. The sort of diamond folks get shot over. She stopped fretting with a tired sigh and then slipped the ring off her finger. I don't need this where I'm going, she said, as she extended the jewellery to me. I took it. I'd been raised hungry enough not to reject a diamond when offered, that was good enough payment for me. I was happy to let her off right there, but then she reached into her purse, paid quadruple the airport fare, and wished me a good night. It was only then that she opened the door and walked off into the pitch darkness beyond. I didn't stop her. I was still in shock from the paycheck I held in my palm. I didn't stop her then, but I should have. I should have locked the doors and called the cops and demanded the old woman explain herself. But I didn't. I didn't want to involve the authorities on account of the diamond. But the ring did pique my curiosity about the care home fares. A couple of days later, in the most casual way possible, I approached the dispatch girl. She said that the orders came in through the reservation system each month but that she knew nothing else about the details. I didn't want to raise any heat, so I dropped it. The question of the ring still tugged at my sleep, though. So a couple of days later, before my shift, I took a ride to the airport. During the day, the stretch of road where I usually stopped was far more populated, but the oppressive darkness wasn't hiding anything interesting. To the left, there were fields of rapeseed, and to the right, up a little hill, there was a fence dividing the public from one of the landing strips of the airport. The top of the fence had barbed wire and there were no gates to pass through. I almost dropped the matter then, but on my way back to the city I stopped by the nursing home. When I spoke to the receptionist I tried to be, again, as casual as possible, but the moment I mentioned I was the taxi driver who picked up fares every first Friday of the month, the girl's jaw dropped and suddenly she was the one asking questions. She too was confused about the rides. She wanted to know what happened to the old folks, whether there was anyone waiting for them at the airport or whether they at least talked about where they were going. She suspected something was wrong. The moment I told her who I was, I got a chill down my spine. She seemed like the type to call the cops, cops that might conduct interviews and take evidence. I've been driving a cab for long enough to know what happens to jewellery left in evidence lockers. If someone was going to misappropriate the ring, it was going to be me. I told her everything was fine, that the old folks just got out of the airport, paid me and went on their merry way. She didn't seem 
too convinced with my explanation, but by the time she was asking more questions, I was halfway out the door. I just decided to accept my good fortune and move on. My grandmother wouldn't be proud, but that ring was worth more than anything I owned in my life. That diamond bought me my fair share of poker hands. I've always liked to play cards. It gave me something to do on my off evenings, and every once in a while it would afford me a nice bottle or something. I've always liked to play cards, but the rush of playing for a couple of days' wages is nothing compared to cashing in a diamond. I did well. In my first two weeks, my luck brought me enough dividends to consider retiring. My third week made those vague plans a lot more concrete, but then, as these stories always go, Lady Luck found some different sob. You might think that I started asking my airport fares if they had jewellery out of greed, but the occasional ring or necklace I'd pick up on my rides quickly ended up being my lifeboat through the month. I had once again ended up in debt to some unkind characters, the ones that lend to cabbies and the ones that lend to high rollers, however, differ in temperament. At the start of every month, I'd rake in the cash on my airport fares, but I saw very little of it past the inside of my cab. It was during those miserable months that I'd find myself locked in an endless cycle of regret. If I had only rejected the ring, I thought, I wouldn't be in this mess. I had turned into a man the grandmother who raised me wouldn't recognise. I hated myself every time I shook down the old folks for their jewellery, and I felt even worse when I had to shark it up later in the night. I regretted not putting a stop to everything while I was still ahead. I cursed myself for not rejecting that ring when I still had the chance. Yet in all that self-loathing, I never wondered where those old timers were going. I rejected that question. I wholeheartedly refused to wonder about the thick cloud of darkness that descended on us and the way the radio would crackle and anything at all connected with that deathly ride. I buried those questions because I knew they wouldn't lead me anywhere pleasant. For months, I kept a lid on that coffin. But two weeks ago, a familiar face rose from the grave. A stout woman with full cheeks and kind eyes. She looked just like my grandmother. And when she got in the cab, she even grunted the same way my grandmother did whenever she got out of her chair. She told me she was going to the airport. I asked her where she was flying to. With a kind smile, she told me she wasn't allowed to say. But then, as we pulled out of the nursing home, she started to chat with me. I can't remember what we talked about, but she did start by asking how long I've been driving a cab for. Her name was Gabriella. Back in her younger days, she used to be a teacher. She asked me what my name was. When I told her, she let out a long sigh. As the darkness descended around us, Gabriella said my mother's name. My mother had been in the first class of high school students Gabriella ever taught. She remembered her well. She spoke at length about how creative my mother was and how hard she worked in class. Briefly, Gabriella mentioned what a tragedy it was that my mother passed so young, but then she continued to talk about her in the present tense as if she was still around. Then after telling me that I had my mother's face, she touched the side of my arm and asked me to stop the car. Taking a hefty lump of bills out of her purse, she said she would like to get out. I again asked her where she was going. She again told me she wasn't allowed to say. This time her voice wasn't as kind. She placed the money in the armrest and reached for the door. I don't know if it was because she looked like my grandmother or because she knew my mother or whether the guilt of the months had simply compounded and been unearthed by a familiar face. I don't know what drove me, but I refused to let the old woman out into the pitch darkness. I, I locked the doors. All the warmth had drained out of Gabriella. She spoke slowly, and each word slid off her lips like a dagger. She wanted out. 
If I wasn't going to let her out, she was going to call the police. It was as if the taxi's headlights were pointed at cloudy water. The world scarcely existed a metre or two before us. I refused to let the old woman into the incomprehensible darkness that surrounded us. In turn, she fished out an old flip phone and slowly pressed in three numbers. Squinting her eyes at the little screen, she put the phone on speaker. My resolve was strong when she had threatened to call the police, yet it softened considerably when I heard the voice on the other side of the call. Before Gabriella responded to the cops, she gave me one last chance to back out. I did. I unlocked the doors, and she hung up, and wished me good night, and grunted her way off into the abyss. Back then I didn't know where Gabriella was going. <laughs> if I did, I... I would have kept the doors locked. I would have driven as far away from that horrible patch of road and gotten arrested and trialled and jailed. I would have done whatever was in my power to keep Gabriella from her grisly fate. But I didn't. I unlocked the doors and let her leave. My immediate instinct was to get as far away from that patch of road and never work a Friday night again, but my feet refused to press the pedals. Instead, I just sat there in that patch of cloudy black, completely paralysed. My eyes were wet, and there was a hot poker travelling up my throat, and it was in that moment of absolute misery that I noticed the purse. Gabriella left behind her purse, and all that bounced in my head was my grandmother complaining about how his young people don't help. I flicked on my hazard lights, grabbed the purse, and stepped out into the darkness. The flashlight on my phone did less to combat the murky night than my headlights did. With the night surrounding me being almost impenetrable, I had to palm my way around the taxi to make my way. I couldn't see anything, and in my blindness, I almost turned back, but when I reached the back seat door of the taxi, the darkness gave away the slightest bit, as if Gabrielle had somehow cut through the fog of black. The darkness lessened from the door of the taxi. My eyes still struggled to make sense of the world, but I could see the old woman once more. She was crawling on all fours up the hill towards the barbed wire fence of the airport. The hill wasn't particularly steep, but she wasn't particularly young. Gabriella was struggling with her climb. Watching the old woman crawl up the hill like a shivering infant made the burning coal in my throat burst into flames. I called out to Gabriella. I demanded she come down from the hill, that she get back in the taxi, that she explain herself. Or at least I tried to call out to her. At the moment I opened my mouth, it was as if all the breath had been pulled from my lungs. The shouts that I hoped would dissuade the elderly woman from crawling up that dark hill turned into nothing but strained whispers. I took a deep breath and try to shout once more, but then, just as Gabriella reached the top of the hill, a, a terrible sound blasted through the world. It was an unnameable sort of tone that was a mix of low hums and the gnashing of metal. As impossible as the sound is to describe, its volume was deafening. It came from behind the barbed wire fence and was accompanied with the rhythmic blinking of two blood red lights. The flashing lights and the deafening noise terrified me beyond words. But the effect they had on the frail woman was outside the limits of human comprehension. As if she'd been yanked by some eldritch puppeteer hiding in the darkness, Gabriella jumped to her feet and spread out her arms as if she was giving worship to the unseen moon. Then, like an athlete in her prime, the old woman leapt at the chain link fence and started to climb to its top. Uh, there was no stopping her, but I did try. I ran up the hill, trying to scream past the roaring engine that had drowned out the rest of the world. It was of no use. She climbed the fence with incredible speed. By the time she reached the barbed wire, it was clear. There was no stopping her. I've driven a cab for 15 years. I've seen things. 
disturbing things, disgusting things, things that would steal away sleep even from the most hardened of men. None of them compared to the old woman's meat with the razor sharp claws of the wire. The metal ate away her clothes and, and, and flesh, yet she didn't exhibit the slightest bit of pain. Instead, Gabriella seemed to angle her body as to maximize contact. Her eyes were rolled back in her head, revealing only the whites. And even from down below, I could see a familiar kind of smile on her lips. That smile disappeared the moment she noticed me. As if she'd just woken up from a long sleep, her eyes took in the world around her in complete confusion. As gnarled as her body was by the metal teeth, however, Gabriella seemed to be more shocked by my presence than the state of her body. I could not hear her past the indescribable cacophony from behind the fence, but it was clear she was screaming at me. Even with her arm trapped inside of the sharp wire and brace, she tried shooing me away. Then as suddenly as the terrible sound from beyond the fence came, it started to die down. Blood red lights, the oppressive darkness, they started to dissipate into an overcast January night. For the briefest of moments, as the impenetrable abyss turned into an overcast night, I could see hints of what was hiding behind the fence. The red lights were attached to the edges of wings. Towering above us, big as an office building, stood a mammoth black Airbus. As massive as the plane was, however, it faded from reality as quickly as its horrid engine. By the time I could hear the old woman, her injuries had robbed her shouts of structure. She, she screamed in between her coughs and groans and moans that it was my fault, that it was my fault that I came in and that I saw her. If someone saw her, she groaned, she wasn't allowed to go. They didn't like it when outsiders saw. By the time the paramedics arrived, she was long dead. Not being able to get her body off the fence, a fire truck joined the group of blinking lights at the side of the road. The cops were not far behind. And there's no sense in telling them about the ring or about any of the other rides that ended in the middle of that dark road. That would only make me a bigger suspect. In regards to the events of that night, however, I told the cops what happened. She wanted me to stop the car. She tried calling the cops when I didn't want to let her off in the middle of the road. She climbed the fence herself. The authorities didn't like this explanation, and they kept me in holding for as long as they legally could, but when no direct evidence of wrongdoing showed, they had to let me go. When I left the station nearly two days later, I didn't feel victorious. I felt guilty. I had not killed the woman with my own hands. In fact, I did whatever was in my power to keep her away from the horrid things that were hiding in the darkness. I had, however, for months and months and months, led other strangers down the exact same path. I'm in no financial position to leave my job. But... I hoped that getting someone else to take my first Friday of the month shift would be easy. Whenever I bumped into any of my colleagues over cigarettes or coffee, however, they would avoid me. I used to be sweet on the dispatch girl. Used to be. While I was sitting in the interrogation rooms, she was busy making up her own theories about how responsible I was for Gabriella's death. The casual questions I'd asked about the airport fair suddenly turned into evidence of wrongdoing. I might have been exonerated by the state, but the stories that float around my workplace take my presumption of innocence as a farce. When I first walked out of that police station, I was certain that I would never drive between the Wolf Pines assisted living facility and the airport ever again. But as the weeks passed by, I fear that I will. No one will talk to me, let alone switch shifts with me. I fear what will happen on the first Friday of the month.
Okay. I know I promised I wouldn't come back to this corner of the web. Honestly, when I made that promise, I was sure I'd keep to it. When my situation, uh, <laughs> developed the following night, I kept mum. Just like I said the last time that I came here, all I wanted to do was to move on. And I did move on. For a couple of months, at least. I didn't speak about Lola. I did my best not to think about Lola, and, and for a couple of months, it worked. The reality that my furry companion was used as a flesh puppet by some eldritch force became so distant that it could be ignored. Until tonight. After months of not having to deal with the incomprehensible realities behind Marana Air, tonight I was confronted by those terrible questions again. I came here partially to clear my head, to try to make sense of what I had witnessed tonight. I also came here because you all have been spamming my DMs, begging for closure. You wanted to know what actually happened to Lola, what those bleeding red lips in the crystal ball were, you wanted to know more about Marana Air. I still don't have all the answers to your questions, but if I tell you what happened tonight, maybe my inbox will stop overflowing. The main reason I'm here, however, is because I'm done with all this. I know I said it before, but I won't say it again. This is the last time I'm going to stumble into this weird corner of the internet. This is the last time I'm ever going to talk about Lola, at least about her corpse. You can't understand how done I am with all of this. What happened, happened. I just want to go back to my regular, comprehensible life. Before I do, however, I guess I just need to close the book on this chapter of my existence. And just consider this post one big slamming of the pages. If you're not familiar, I came to this forum a couple of months back to talk about my cat, Lola. She died right before I was meant to move halfway across the globe, and I was forced to use Marana Air to transport her corpse. I've had Lola for over 14 years, and seeing her go was beyond heartbreaking, but what I found at the Prague airport was considerably worse. My cat wasn't dead anymore. My dead cat arrived alive and, well, different. Her high-pitched mouths turned into strange guttural groans and she smelled like death itself. In utter confusion about the fate of my beloved pet, I went over to a local paranormal expert I'm pretty confident the woman was a scam artist, but during the meeting, my cat managed to get its paws on her crystal ball. Whatever was pulling the strings inside of my dead cat communicated with us. It talked about vessels and rings of salt and finding things that are not yet born. Crazy, spooky shit. And that's when I called it quits. I left Lola's animal container in front of a KFC, caught a tram back home, and wrote my update post. The bloody lips, the, the terrible smell, the, the trauma of my dead cat being used as some vessel. It was all way too much. And like I said in the post, I was dead set on never thinking about the whole affair ever again. I sanctified that promise with a bottle of wine and some crying, and then I went to sleep. By the time I went to bed, most of the rotting smell had aired out of my apartment. There was still a week left before the start of the school year, and the forecast predicted clear skies. I went to sleep in hopes of waking up in the late morning to finally explore my neighborhood. Instead, I woke up before sunrise to my neighbor banging on my door. She didn't speak English, and I didn't speak Czech, but with a bit of help from Google Translate, her issue with me became clear. Your cat loud. 
your cat loud on street. Take your cat, you bitch. Before the translation was done, I could hear those horrible wails. Even though I left her on the other side of the city, my cat had somehow found my apartment. The neighbor was furious, and I understood her well enough to know she was talking about calling the police. The last thing I wanted was to have to explain the Lola situation to the authorities. The moment I opened the door to the apartment complex, the creature ran past my feet and scurried up the stairs. When I got to my front door, the cat, once again, ignored me. Lola's corpse rushed past the hallway and took a seat by the window. It's only then that she acknowledged me. Her eyes kept on darting from me to a pigeon's nest across the courtyard. She kept on staring and meowing, and I had no idea what to do. For a couple of minutes, I desperately googled animal shelters, but none of them were open before sunrise. Filled with despair and slowly turning nauseous from the smell the cat dragged in, I tried going back to sleep. Much like the night prior, I didn't get any rest. Whenever my mind did drift away from the presence of the living feline corpse in my bedroom, it drifted towards memories of Berlin and adventurous school kids falling off of roofs. I lay there in the dark, trapped between getting the rest that I so desperately needed and finding a solution to the meowing corpse I was stuck with. When the dimness of my room gave way to a weak red glow, I thought I had made it to sunrise. I was wrong. No, no, no. The time is running out. Soon I will be trapped. Soon the bind will be permanent. No, no, no. I require a thing not yet born. A circle of salt. This is not the vessel I have paid for. Her eyes shone like burning rubies from across the room. She was hanging atop the paper lampshade I had on my bedroom light. Those bleeding red lips were barely visible behind the folds of paper. Yet, the voice in my head was as clear as it had ever been. Low and terrible and haunting. It spoke to me about things not yet born and vessels. For a couple breathless seconds, I watched the demoniac cat sway from side to side on my lampshade, but then I had enough. I got out of bed and demanded answers. I demanded to know what happened to my Lola and why the horrible beast was tormenting me. My sleep-deprived screaming did nothing to phase the cat. When I finished, however, the voice in my skull spoke up once more. Yes, 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 you care for the vessel. You love the vessel. You will help me and we shall both be in joy. Yes, 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 an unborn thing. A circle of salt. I shall be a being of fetters, and you shall see the vessel return to its rightful owner. Smoke started to stem from beneath the cat's body. Before I had a chance to ask another question, the paper lampshade lit up in flames. The metal frame of the lamp quickly shed the burning paper, and the fire burnt fast. And I managed to douse my carpet with a jug of water before too much of my security deposit burnt away. Yet, by the time I took care of the blaze, the cat was gone. She had hopped out of the window, walked on the tin roofs, and sat right by the pigeon's nest across the courtyard. The creature's gaze was singular. It wanted me to follow. Crawling eight stories in the air over ancient roofs just to follow a cat that was meant to be dead was the last thing I wanted to do with my morning. I don't like heights, and more importantly, I'm not insane. Instead, 
I brewed myself a coffee in hopes of finding some rhyme and reason in my life. The caffeine helped. The lack of a horrid smelling corpse in my apartment helped even more. As I stood by my window watching the cat, however, those demonic words kept on slithering through my head. You shall see the vessel return to its rightful owner. Maybe it was the jolt from the coffee, combined with the sleep deprivation. Maybe it was the promise of seeing Lola again. And maybe I just wanted the whole dead cat affair to end, and crawling out of the window seemed like the only choice. Whatever the reason, that's what I did. I got on all fours and, and crawled across the tin roofs to retrieve the thing that was not yet born. My journey to the nest was quick. The metal beneath me groaned and somewhere in the back of my head there was a voice that kept on insisting I was going to tumble to my death. But I moved quickly. The nest on the other side of the courtyard was constructed from straw and plastic bags and and cigarette butts. A lone inch-sized egg sat in its center. As if mimicking the gentle movements of my Lola, the cat nudged the egg with its nose. Then, once my goal had been established, the cat scampered back on the roofs and returned to my apartment. My journey to the nest was quick, yet the return took an eternity. The fear and insanity of where I was and what I was doing caught up with me. My movements were much less sure than the cat's, and my weight left behind a considerable trail of dents. About halfway through my journey, a spot of roof where I had crawled over before shifted and sent me sliding down towards certain death. Luckily, I managed to stop myself from falling by shoving my foot into one of the ancient rain gutters. Most of that morning has been forcefully scrubbed from my memory, but balancing on the edge of a roof with a pigeon egg between my thumb and forefinger will forever stay seared into my mind. When I entered my apartment again, the cat seemed to express something resembling joy. Its howls were still dark and undeniably eldritch, but the cat moved around excitedly as I drew a circle with my salt shaker. I placed the tiny egg in the middle of the circle, making my kitchen counter look like a cartoon eye. My mind was completely blank after crawling over roofs, and I was barely holding myself together, but my guesses proved correct. When I placed the egg in the circle of salt, the cat curled up around the egg and started to purr. It started to purr, and... It sounded exactly like my Lola. The cat sat in the circle of salt and purred and slowly, ever so slowly, its fur started to bristle. The coarse gray of my dead cat's fur faded into the fluffy white of Lola's youth. With her eyes still closed, she started to meow. That horrible, dark tenor was completely gone. The cat on the counter sounded just like my Lola again. And when she opened her eyes, the milkiness was completely gone from them. She could see again. She could see, and she didn't look a day older than when I moved into my first student flat. I had traveled halfway across the world, and didn't sleep for two days, and, and crawled over roofs, but sitting in front of me was Lola. At her feet, the pigeon egg started to hatch. The eggshell didn't break from the top, it cracked from all sides as if it contained an inflating balloon. Whatever came out of it wasn't a pigeon. The bird was jet black with red eyes and grew with each breath. Feathers sprouted from the bird as Lola's fur grew fluffier and fluffier. She looked just like the kebab-hungry kitten that had 
followed me back home in university. She was small and fluffy and meowing just like she did when she was alive. But she was getting smaller. Lola was getting smaller and, and the black bird kept growing. When she was nothing but a fluffy clump of white, her fur started to retract. What was once a cute kitten turned into a hairless gerbil. In seconds, she undid weeks of development until she was nothing but a thumb-sized chunk of flesh. Before my Lola could be thrown backwards through time any further, the bird ate her, spread its wings, and flew out of my apartment window. And in response, I spent three days in a crisis center, barely holding on to my sanity. I walked out with the firm belief that none of this happened. That's the only way I could keep my shit together enough for the start of the school year. It's also why I didn't come rushing back to this corner of the internet for an update. Whenever I had a moment alone, all I could think about was the fur retracting into Lola's little body. The first few nights were horrid. Prague, however, is a colorful enough city to help keep the mind occupied. I signed up for every new staff activity there was and scoured the internet for any interest groups that could take up my spare time. After a couple days, the smell of rot left my apartment. After a couple of washes, my clothes smelled like clothes again. It wasn't easy, but I moved on. I kept myself busy with work and found friends and settled in my new three-year home. Occasionally, when I'd find myself crossing through IP Pavlova, or whenever I stared out of my window for too long, I'd get uncomfortable. But Prague and school kept me busy. I was happy, but now I'm here. One of my friends threw a birthday picnic near the Lutna Beer Garden today. The picnic ended up being a lot more about booze than food, and by the time it was packed up, I was still hungry. The folks that were left at the end of the picnic wanted to go bar hopping, but I was more than done for the night. There's a tram across the river that takes me back home, so down from Lutna Hill... I swung by the beer garden to grab a kebab. The plan was to eat the kebab at home, but I was starving, and the view from the bridge was nice. The Prague Castle was all lit up, and the tourist boats were floating by, and the kebab was delicious. I was having the time of my life, but then... I saw something that brought the horror crashing back. Two bright red eyes. Jet black feathers. I sat on the railing, watching me. I tried to shoo it away. I tried to convince myself that it was just some weird diseased pigeon that had crawled into an old chimney. But the stare was undeniable. The initial shock left me scared. But the alcohol turned that fear to anger. I demanded to know what the creature was. What it wanted from me. The pigeon stayed completely still. Its featureless red eyes betraying no emotion. It isn't until I asked about what happened to Lola that the horrible bird moved. The soul which you seek is dead. The dark voice thundered in my skull when the pigeon landed on a bridge lamp. It died far from here. Yes, yes, yes. What you saw in the morning of my rebirth was simply the muscle memory of a dead vessel. The light glowed red, and much brighter than any of the other street lamps. None of the drivers paid attention to me. Cars and Trams and buses sped around me without a care in the world. As for my wants, I want nothing from you. 
No, no, no. Our paths have only crossed because of a clerical error. I have been invited to your realm to watch. I am here to witness the final century. I have no... The glass shattered beneath the bird's claws. Instead of continuing to speak, the pigeon sat back down on the railing and continued to stare. I forgot what I asked it. What other crumbs of information about the incomprehensible I begged for. But the bird didn't answer. Instead, it launched at me, grabbed my kebab, and flew away. I know I've said it before, but I'm done. I pray that whatever amount of psychic energy it took to commit this madness to paper is enough to help me move on. I've managed to live like a normal person for the past couple of months. I can do it again. I'm done with weird fortune tellers and crawling over roofs and eldritch spirits, and I'm done with dead cats. I'm done. And I, and I only have one piece of advice to offer. For the love of God, never book a flight with Marana Air. I work as an intern in a Prague-based virtual reality setup. Most of my work revolves around office work that no one else wants to do. Organizing paperwork, follow-up emails, copy edits, picking up coffee, that sort of stuff. On occasion, however, I do house calls where I help people set up the VR rig. There's far too many NDAs preventing me from going into details of how our tech works, but to keep it simple, we use a headset and a couple of spread out motion sensors to provide full body range for player avatars. The process isn't complicated, and we ship with a neat instruction booklet that should clear out any questions. Some of our clientele, however, can't be bothered with the nuances of the setup, so they pay a little extra to have me come around and hook things up. It's usually rich folk who want to outsource their parenting time to a VR setup. From the two or so dozen house calls that I've done this year, more than half of them were in Paris streets, and the rest were dotted around Prague's more obscure wealthy neighborhoods. I'd come in, set up the motion sensors in under 5 minutes, do a little show and tell, and then usually settle down to drink some expensive coffee while answering any leftover questions. I used to like making house calls. Getting out of the office was nice, the expensive coffee was even nicer, and introducing our tech to folks unfamiliar with it provided a great way to break the monotony of my usual days. I used to like making house calls. But after today, after meeting the man who wanted to see everything, I'd really prefer to stick to paperwork. The request came in from an unusual neighborhood, Prague 13. Prague 13 borders the outer edges of the Thousand Year City and might arguably be the least historic part of town, with modernity avoiding the district until the late 70s. It's all old commie blocks and parks out there, so I was surprised to see someone not only buy our expensive VR setup, but also pay the surcharge for a private installation. I was Further surprised when the address on the order didn't point me to normal housing, and pointed me to the middle of a nature reserve. Our setup isn't heavy, but it's not exactly something that's fun to lug around. Usually I'd grab an Uber from the office and have it drop me off at the front door of the client. This time around, however, no car could get me to the address. The best my Uber driver could do was to drop me off at a road in the middle of nowhere hugging the edge of a forest. I've spent most of my adult life in Prague, and I'm well familiar with the various quirks this city has, but my trek through the forest definitely takes the cake. Google Maps assured me that there was a civilized footpath to get me to the address, but what I was presented with was an uneven patch of land where no grass grew, leading through the woods. As unkept as the path was, however, in between the stones and mud and grass I could spy manhole covers adorned with Prague's ancient coat of arms. It very much felt like I had left civilization, but beneath my feet there was an ever-present reminder that I was still connected to the wastewaters of a metropolis. I trudged through the forest with all the equipment until the trees gave way to a clearing. In the center of the clearing, there sat a reservoir connected to a cement shack. Beyond that shack sat a wooden cabin which corresponded to the address I was given. The trek through the forest had put me well off schedule. 
I was long overdue for the installation and I was expected back in the office after I was done. Instead of going towards the cabin, however, I put down the equipment and took a breather by the reservoir. There was just something about the way that the sunlight bounced off the water that scratched something in my lizard brain. The pond was clearly man-made, but it was hugged with reeds and filled with ducks and fish. I watched the animals for a bit and lost myself in a strange cosmic tranquility, until a wholly different animal wrestled my attention away. A bird. A jet black bird with beady red eyes. It stood completely still, just a stone's throw away from me. At first, I thought it was a plastic toy that I had simply not noticed when I sat down. The thing was motionless and completely black from claws to beak and didn't look like any bird I had seen before. But then the thing took a step towards me. I shooed the bird away, but it didn't fly. It just took a couple of steps backwards and continued to watch me with its rat eyes. Whatever semblance of calm I had felt had dissipated. I got up, gathered equipment, and proceeded to walk towards the cabin while avoiding the black bird. The thing kept on following me. It didn't hop or fly. It walked. When I sped up, the bird started to run to keep up. As small as the bird was, it kept pace. To distract myself from discomforting sights, I called the customer to tell him I was near. The voice that came from the other end of the line was strained and old and void of any emotion. The customer didn't seem to be concerned about me running late. He, in fact, sounded rather busy. From the other side of the line, I could hear a cacophony of explosions and gunfire and moans and a dozen different voices saying a dozen different things. As loud as the other side of the line was, however, the customer seemed to understand me clearly. He said he would come out and meet me in case I had any trouble finding his cabin. A couple seconds after I hung up, the doors of the cabin opened up and the customer made his way into the clearing. He was dressed in filthy rags and must have been normal clothes at some point in the previous century. The old man was balding, but his hair and beard looked like they had not seen a razor in decades. The customer was far too old and looked far too disheveled to order our high-tech overpriced VR rig, but what was most discomforting was how he moved. The only thing I can really compare it to is AI-generated animations. The old man's limbs moved completely independent of each other in a way that suggested they each served a different puppet master. He looked as if he was about to fall or sprint or jump, yet the old man didn't either. He simply stumbled in my general direction with a phone in his hand. Are you here to introduce me to the wonders of virtual reality? He asked in a queer voice that will haunt me until the day I die. Yes, I said, and then started to explain how the setup was going to work. The man was wholly uninterested in anything I had to say. Once I had identified myself as a representative of the VR company, all of his attention went back to his phone. I couldn't see what was happening on the screen, but I delivered my explanation to a backing of pained moans. It wasn't until a fluttering of wings passed right by my head that the old man acknowledged me again. Ah, oh, he said, as a red-eyed bird landed on the shoulder. I see you've met my friend. The old man's eyes were bloodshot and his pupils were the size of ticks. Looking at him made me beyond uncomfortable, but what he did next made my stomach feel uneasy. He likes to watch. The old man said, and then, with nauseating speed, his eyes turned sharply in the direction of the bird, without his head moving an inch. Were he a healthy man, I would say I could see the whites of his eyes. But a healthy man, he was not. All I could see was blood-pink flesh ravaged by some unspeakable disease. He has come here to watch the final century, the man said, looking like something out of a medical textbook. But enough about that. Come into my humble home and introduce me to the wonderful world of virtual reality. As he walked towards the cabin, the man's attention went back to his phone. The sound of a roaring chainsaw amplified the pain moans from the screen and finally drowned them out. I managed to sneak a peek at what he was watching. It was one of those cartel beheading videos that 14-year-olds could stumble upon back in the ancient days of Live Leak. Seeing that the man was casually watching execution videos sent a chill down my spine. But by the time we reached the cottage, I found other things to worry about. Before we even reached the front door, I could hear the chaos. The same barrage of sounds I had heard on the other side of the phone was now on the other side of a worn wooden door. One look at the man's home made me think I was going to meet my end. 
The cabin was humble in stature, but every inch of it was covered in screens. Monitors, televisions, loose tablets drawing power from a sea of filthy extension cords on the floor. From Netflix shows to war footage to pornography to Simpsons reruns, the shambling home was filled with a hundred different forms of media battling for attention. I like to watch. The old man with the black bird on his shoulder said with something approaching pride. I have come here to watch, and I will watch, and I hope by the end of it all, I would have seen everything. Before the shock from a menagerie of screens even set in, the stench hit me. All the windows were covered in screens. Among the extension cords and the little room that was left, grimy rags peeked from the floor like fledgling grass. All while trying not to breathe too much, I told the old man there wasn't enough space for the VR setup in the house. He looked at me with his sickly eyes bulging from his skull, and then he laughed. It was an unnatural sound that seemed to come from deep in his guts, and for the whole duration of his laugh, the man didn't break eye contact with me. No! He finally wheezed. This is the room in which I watch. I have a separate room in which I will experience this new reality. Like a ballerina in the midst of electroshock therapy, the old man hopped his way between the wiring. At the far end of the room, nestled between two plasma televisions playing Rick and Morty reruns and snuff films, there sat a doorway. As I tiptoed through the grime and extension cords, I regretted wearing my white sneakers. The stench of filth was never truly gone, but getting past the doorway brought the smell of ancient paper mixed with a bit of fresh air. The old man had led me into a roomy woodshed packed with old newspapers. The shed was the perfect size for the VR setup, but much like the main hall of the cabin, it proved to be a bad choice. The walls of the shed didn't connect to the roof. It wouldn't take much of a storm to get the motion sensors wet and in need of repair. When I told the old man there was a really high chance of the VR setup getting damaged, he, once again, laughed. When those choking sounds finished, he said that money was not an issue. He lived a humble life. If the VR setup got damaged, he could just have me called over to replace it. The thought of revisiting the old man made me want to quit on the spot, so I didn't say anything else. I just set up the equipment as fast as possible and considered myself lucky that the old man wasn't interested in small talk. Usually people will ask questions about the tech, or at least watch me as I put up the sensors. The old man, however, had turned around in the doorway and was watching the chaotic mix of channels on the other side. As the chaos next door roared in its chorus of gunfire and moans and canned laughter, he seemed to grunt to himself in satisfaction. Only the bird, with its beady red eyes, seemed to be interested in what I was doing. Its stare made me work much faster than I ever did. When the setup was finally finished and the headset was booted up, it took me three attempts to get the man's attention. But when I finally had it, it was undivided. I cannot wait to experience this virtual reality. Oh, the things I will see there. He screamed as if he were threatening to fight someone. The moment he had the headset on, he seemed to be completely oblivious to my presence in the room. He started to holler and shout and jump around, screaming about how marvelous this new reality is. As he spun through the demo reel I had loaded him into, the blackbird jumped off his shoulder. It might have been simply dodging the old man's jittery leaps, but the moment the bird took a step towards me, I fled the room. What was in that cabin was well above my pay grade, and I wasn't going to take any chances. I ran past the reservoir, through the forest, and back to where my Uber driver had dropped me off. I ordered another Uber during my mad sprint from that terrible place, yet when I arrived, the driver seemed to be parked at some gas station. When he didn't show up for a solid three minutes, I gathered my breath and ran even further, past the park, past housing projects, and into a subway. I rode the subway to the other side of town wishing with all my might that any memory of that old man or his bird or that terrible cabin would be washed in my mind forever. But they weren't. I do my best not to think about the old man, and for the most part, I succeed. Usually, I can go through my day without ever wondering about that strange afternoon on the outskirts of Prague. Whenever it rains, though, whenever there is even a single dark cloud in the sky, I can't help but to worry. I can't help but to worry that the man who wanted to see everything will require my services once more. <laughs>